healthier in some ways. I mean, like fourth month, so yeah. Fewer Hello, everyone. I call new. to order the September 2023 meeting of the Finance and Operations Committee of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents. Good afternoon, and thank you to those who are joining us by way of li live stream, video, and those attending in our boardroom or by way of Zoom. So let me welcome our student representatives for today. For today, Cole Groshan from the Duluth campus and Flora Yang from the Twin Cities campus. The first item of business this afternoon is the discussion of the 2023-2024 committee work plan. Uh, Vice Chair Wheeler and I uh, met with Senior Vice President Franz over the summer to discuss the priorities of the committee and work together to create a, the work plan that you have before you today. The work plan includes topics from across our committee's uh, portfolio, from human resources to finance and important operational updates. Uh, Senior Vice President Franz, would you like to make any comments about the work plan? Uh, thank you, Chair Hibbs, and thank you for the opportunity to work with you and Vice Chair Wheeler over the summer. I have a couple items I'd like to uh, uh, highlight. In October, uh, the three items that we have for your review today will come back for action. The six-year capital plan and the state capital request, the supplemental budget request, and the Duluth campus plan. So right away, uh, this agenda will move fairly quickly in October. The committee will also hear in October from the Office of Human Resources. Vice President Horseman and his team will provide an overview of the university's job structures and how they have changed over time. The overview will help define the various employee groups, how they use the different job structures, and outline the overall importance of job structures within human resources. After October, the committee will also highlight the ongoing work to implement the Impact 2025 system-wide system strategic plan, which includes an overall progress report in December, We'll have a formal peak implementation update in December and in June, and a sustainability update in May. We understand there is, there, there is a specific interest in topics related to human resources. So in addition to October's presentation on job family structures, we will build on that discussion with a presentation in February on the evolution of those job family structures and how data is used to influence those changes. The committee will also hear about the key strategic initiatives underway within the Office of Human Resources with the presentation of the annual workforce and human resource, resources strategy report in May. We'll also continue our conversation about our physical footprint with today's review of the Duluth campus plan and how that plan interacts with the climate action plan framework. We have a strategic property update scheduled for February and we will present the Rochester campus plan for your review in May. This is an overview of the 2023-24 Finance and Operations Committee work plan. As you can tell, uh, Mr. Chair, the agenda is full and it will grow over the course of the next year, I promise. <laughs> uh, thank you, Vice President uh, Franz. Any discussion? Um, hearing none, uh, we'll move on to our second item of business. Our second item is review of the interim president's uh, recommended 2023 six-year capital plan and the 2024 state capital request. Let me welcome uh, interim president uh, editor, senior vice president Franz, and vice president Robert Davis to introduce the six-year capital plan and the state capital request. Interim President Edinger, please take it away. You bet, thank you so much, Chair Hibsch. The six-year capital plan and the 2024 state capital request both align with Impact 2025, the U's system-wide strategic plan. They reflect our priority to preserve our existing physical assets to support the university's mission. Asset preservation really continues to be the smartest, most cost-effective way to protect and extend the useful life of investments that have been made by taxpayers through capital bonding, by students who pay tuition, and by donors who give to support the university's mission. I'd like to turn the presentation over to Senior Vice President Franz and Vice President Robert Davis to talk about this. Chair Hips, um, members of the board, we have before you two items in one package. We will be talking about the university's 2023 six-year capital plan, improvement plan, and in particular, we will be focusing on the first year of that plan, which is the university's 2024 state capital request. Vice President Robert Stavis will walk us through both of these term, these items, including the details on the consultative process we engaged in this summer as part of the development of those requests. This plan, and especially the six-year, the state capital request, 
presents a significant shift in strategy with regard to state support for asset preservation, also called HEPR, which is an acronym for Higher Education Asset Preservation and Replacement. We'll look forward to your feedback on this presentation, and I'll note that we just introduced Vice President Robert Davis. Was it June or July? I forgot. Mm -hmm. July. July. Yeah. July. 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 Yeah. And here she is to make her first presentation, not to put any pressure on you, <laughs> Vice President. No pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Senior Vice President Franz. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, Chair Hipsch and members of the board. You will recall that the six-year plan is required by board policy and is the document that sets the, the direction for major capital projects. This multi-year planning process ensures that we are focusing our limited resources and our limited capacity on our highest priority projects. You'll find the plan and its supporting documents on pages 18 through 29 in your docket materials. The six-year plan includes two components. The first component of the plan is what we intend to ask the state for uh, in funding in the next three sessions. This is our traditional state capital request, and I'll talk more in detail about the 2024 state request later in this presentation. The second component is a list of university-funded projects that we are currently either in the pre-design or design phase for, and that we believe will advance into the design and construction phases in the next six years. In addition to the actual plan, you will see in the docket materials a list of projects that are under consideration. These projects are included in this format to provide transparency on the major capital initiatives that are not yet ready to be included in the plan. Work on these initiatives continues. Some will come to fruition and some may not, but we do want to provide you with a clear picture of the pipeline of projects that may come before this board in the lifespan of this plan. As projects advance from planning into full design and construction, they become uh, part of our request for board approval in the ap annual capital budget or mid-year as the capital budget amendment. You see these projects again when you approve their schematic design and they come before you generally in the committee's consent report. For example, the Carlson School of Management building revitalization was included in the six-year plan last year, but was not yet ready for inclusion in the annual capital budget this past spring. The project recently finalized its funding, and we will anticipate that it will come before you in the next month as a capital budget amendment. The plan before you is built around advancing the priorities outlined on this slide. These planning goals, which have been used for the past several years and previously shared with the board, are reflected in both the projects we are requesting from the state and the projects that the university will be funding with its own resources. <coughs> These planning priorities are consistent with the themes elevated in the system-wide consultative process that we use to develop both the supplemental operating budget and the 2024 state capital request. I'll say more about that process in just a moment. But before we leave the topic of the six-year plan, I want to, want to call your attention to the format of this year's report, it's slightly different. Those of you with past experience on this topic will note two specific changes. The first change is that the state request portion of the plan includes three sessions of the traditional six-session look ahead. <coughs> As state bond funding has become less predictable, the later years of recent plans had generic placeholders. This plan includes the next three years, which is sufficient time to conduct the necessary planning and pre-design work, but avoids raising expectations for projects that may or may not be funded in the six-year horizon. The second change is to group all of the university-funded projects to get together uh, rather than to assign them in specific years. This format still shows the major projects that are likely to advance in the annual capital budget in the next six years as required by board policy. The goal of these changes is to provide a much more accurate and concise view of the capital planning pro process and activities that are currently underway. And of course, we'll welcome any feedback that you have on this new format. So as we look to state capital budget planning, I'd like to spend a few moments on the next few slides uh, since what's before you this month is different than the preliminary 2024 state capital request that you saw back in June. In 2023, despite both record state surpluses and a record-breaking capital investment bill, only a small portion of the university's request was funded. In fact, the $136 million that the university did receive represents only about 6% of the state's total capital investment, which is a new all-time low. And as I noted earlier, state bond funding is less predictable than ever. There is very little ability to predict 
when the university will receive funding or how much funding it will receive. That unpredictability makes it very difficult to create accurate and meaningful multi-year plans and to align the development of individual project plans with the availability of state funding. What we're proposing for this coming year is to ask the state to fund a major investment in asset preservation. One ask for $500 million for asset preservation and no new building projects. A $500 million investment would be allocated system-wide using our standard HEPA formula that balances total campus square footage with facility condition needs. Our 10-year facility need continues to increase year over year. And as a system, our facility condition assessment shows a $6 billion need with a growing number of buildings on each campus in poor and critical condition. These conditions affect teaching, learning, and research for thousands of students, faculty, and staff across the system on a daily basis. Just this week, Duluth encouraged faculty flexibility in rescheduling, canceling, or moving classes online because temperatures in two buildings had exceeded 85 degrees. We have to try something different. Working with our colleagues at Minnesota State, they are taking a similar approach. Their state request, which is of a similar size, is entirely focused on renewing existing assets. It's our hope that by both of us asking for asset preservation and renewal funding, that we can impress upon the state the need to reinvest in these critical public assets. The change to our focus from the preliminary request we shared in June came about as the result of a series of consultation meetings that we held over the summer with chancellors, faculty, deans, students, and staff. More than 50 people from across the system were invited to participate in a series of conversations focused on identifying our highest priority and most impactful investments for both the capital and operating budget requests. On the capital side, there was a general consensus around the need to prioritize investments in our existing facilities with the goal of improving student experience, research competitiveness, and climate sustainability. A significant investment in asset preservation will help achieve both the objectives identified through our consultation process and the priorities outlined by the board for the six-year <clears throat> capital plan. In the next few slides, I'll walk through a few examples of how each campus will illustrate uh, what could be accomplished with the $500 million asset preservation investment. First, the Crookston campus's $118 million 10-year facility renewal need is about 2% of our system-wide $6 billion need. While this need is small relative to some of our other campuses, there are some critical projects there, the most significant being the campus heating plant. The UMC heating plant was built in 1911 and significant components of the plant are obsolete and failing. With severe winter conditions affecting Crookston as our most, nor most northerly campus, this is a daily operations concern that could cause widespread disruption to the campus. For example, last year it took nearly three months to acquire a critical part, which arrived just in the nick of time for heating season. On the Duluth campus, a $500 million HEPA investment would allow the campus to make transformational investments in three student-focused academic buildings, Heller Hall, Humanities Building, and the old library annex. HEPA funding would also address critical needs including asbestos abatement, fire, life safety upgrades including fire alarm, sprinklers, plumbing, electrical, and HVAC updates. These classroom buildings serve well over half of the students on the UMD campus in any given year in music education, American Indian studies, business, pharmacy, and writing studies, just to name a few. The two buildings that experienced high temperatures earlier this week would be on the list for HVAC improvements. On a percentage basis, Morris has the greatest number of buildings in poor and critical condition. Its campus includes some of the system's oldest building, and the number one priority for UMM is the Multi-Ethnic Resource Center. This student-focused building lacks even the most basic accessibility. Sufficient funding from the state would allow the campus to add an elevator and fix a whole host of other building condition issues. This is an essential investment that will result in a more accessible and more inclusive, welcoming environment for students. The 12 research and field stations are spread across the state from Ely to Waseca, and each has its own unique facility challenges. Projects at these sites tend to be smaller, but equally impactful to the work that goes on there. 
Not surprisingly, the Twin Cities campus makes up the greatest portion of the facility need. Here, with the level of funding we're requesting, we have the opportunity to make some impactful investments in the future of our teaching and research spaces. High priority projects include the Food Science and Nutrition Building on the St. Paul campus. Built in 1956, the Food Science and Nutrition Facility consists mainly of classrooms and laboratories. It's also home to the Food Science Pilot Plant, where Minnesota food companies like General Mills and Cargill partner with the U to develop and test new products. Building systems are well beyond their useful life and are no longer reliable or sustainable. This project will replace aged infrastructure and provide much needed code and life safety improvements. We also plan to use asset preservation funds to advance campus space utilization and climate sustainability goals. For example, a significant investment in Eddy Hall, coupled with other collegiate and donor funds, will advance our efforts to vacate and de demolish Pike Hall in the historic knoll. The largest number of projects, however, are the essential but non-glamorous ones that allow the campus to simply function. System-wide, we have 900 roofs, 26 million square feet of windows, that's 540 football fields worth, 450 elevators, and more than 175 buildings that have no or only partial fire sprinkler systems. This request will make significant progress in addressing critical needs with major investments in elevators, fire and life safety, disability access roofs, windows, electrical systems, waterproofing, and mechanical systems. But funding renewal is just part of the solution to our deferred renewal need. The university also needs to learn to operate with less and make progress towards its goal of reducing its square footage. Reducing square footage has the triple benefit of reducing our operating costs, reducing our deferred renewal need, and reducing our carbon footprint. Where possible, it's our goal to allocate the HEPR funds we receive to projects that directly or indirectly advance our space consolidation goals. Investments in Eddy Hall, which I mentioned earlier, will help in demolishing Pike Hall, and investments in some of our larger health sciences buildings will assist in consolidating public health and vacating the West Bank office building. This capital request is a bold new approach. Asking for only asset preservation dollars is something we haven't tried before. We hear from legislators across the state that it's more important to take care of what we have than to ask for something new. And our message to the legislature this year will be, we heard you. We will highlight examples of how asset preservation supports our goals around student experience, the training of talent to support the state's future workforce, sustainability, and research and innovation. We also plan to describe our commitment to right-size the overall amount of campus space. Going all in on asset preservation means that some individual projects have come off our preliminary state capital requests, like FARM and the Academic Health Center in Duluth. Both of these are important and we'll continue developing more design work on them, and we will go back and seek funding from the state and other sources in 2025. And just as a reminder, President Edinger has recused himself from all farm-related issues as they relate to the Hormel Foundation in Moore County. Finally, I'd like to call your attention to some important upcoming dates. We have already had visits to the Crookston and Duluth campuses by <clears throat> the Senate, and we're looking forward to additional visits from the House, Senate, and Minnesota Management and Budget as they make their way around the state. We are also excited to host the project kickoff for the Fraser Hall renovation on September 26, which, thanks to state funding, will re-envision undergraduate chemistry teaching laboratories on the Twin Cities campus. This item is here today only for review, and so we'll be back before you next month with a request for action. That concludes my remarks, unless Senior Vice President Franz or Interim President Edinger would like to add anything. But if not, we are ready for any questions you may have. Uh, thank, for, thank you, Vice President uh, Roberts Davis. Uh, we have uh, Regent Mary Turner. Thank you. Go ahead. Jerry Hipsch. Um, you know, as a registered nurse, my, my um, perspective that I always take and always will take is safety and health. And so I want to commend you all for um, coming up with this budget to take care of what I finally call the honeydew list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because keeping our, our faculty and our staff and our students um, safe, dry, and warm is going to always be a top priority. 
with me because like the heating system in Crookston, it may be the smallest campus, but the concept that they are even dealing with that, I have family that are from up there, it gets really cold up there. Mm -hmm. That's something that this coming winter, I'll be saying extra Hail Marys to make sure they make it through the winter, okay? And so um, I appreciated the, the tour that we took up there, um, but just know that I am extremely pleased with the way we're going with this. Um, and there are definitely projects that need to be done ASAP, and I do have one request. Can we be getting federal money for some of this through the what I learned last night, I, IRA, is that right? Um, Regent Kenyanya, the, right. So is there a way that we can get some of this uh, money with this administration that's all into helping with these kind of things? Go ahead, uh, Vice President Fads. Uh Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Regent uh, Turner. <clears throat> you raised really important points. I think that we, uh, I, I wanna mention why you don't see these, uh, some of these asset preservation issues as much as you might think. We talk about the big need, but we have literally hundreds of thousands of people who do their best to, so, to make sure you don't see them and that they're safe on a day-to-day -day basis. If it wasn't safe, we would close the building. Mm -hmm. But you never know when a roof, as in north of last winter, can, can uh, give way to unusual conditions. So uh, we do a really, really good job of maintaining and and taking care of space and making it last another year. So we're, in a way, our own worst enemy when it comes to trying to show what we need. And so that's why you don't necessarily always see that, unless you take a, a tour like you did to really get behind the scenes and see what's there. And the heating plant in Crookston is a good example of, uh, if you saw that thing, you would not sleep quite as well in the north, potentially. So these are issues we have to address. And one of the things we try to do, especially in a lot of our <coughs> Um, uh, grant uh, applications is to seek additional federal, sometimes federal dollars come uh, with the opportunity to invest in labs or upgrade labs and do certain things, but we, uh, we will continue to, through our federal delegation, um, work as, as much as we can to get whatever federal dollars we can to enhance uh, some of these projects. Most of the time you have to, it has to be part of a project of some nature, and so the key is tying a building and a program to a federal uh, authorization. And that's, that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, and, but we, we are watching out for those too, so we'll continue to look for those opportunities. And we would like the federal government to share in our success. Thank you. Uh, any follow-up? No. Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Hipsch. Uh, I would echo that I think us focusing on HEPR um, in asset preservation in general makes a lot of sense and just really targeting our request for all the same region, uh, reasons that Regent Turner just talked about and understanding feedback we've got from the legislature previously. Um, just one question on um, page uh, 47 of the docket, which is the space consolidation slide. Um, and maybe this is just the first time that I'm personally tuning into this as much or maybe some of this um, space consolidation detail is new information to us. I don't want to claim it hasn't been presented because it could just be me. Um, but I'm wondering, I guess, with some of these examples um, that you listed, and there could be more, you know, what what um, is the consultation or um, governance process that's going into, like, especially when I see the word demolish, I think that's pretty significant. And maybe, again, this has been talked about in other settings, but just wondering, you know, how we've... Um, how, how these have come to be and what the consultation process is looking like. And um, yeah, just a little bit more information with the space consolidation part, which is a concept I think makes sense. Okay. Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Farnsworth, that's a very good question. And this is a um, very long deliberative process that we go through to identify space that can be consolidated and reduced. As that happens, we're able to uh, create sort of a cycle of things that almost like a domino effect. As things are consolidated, it opens up room for other users or tenants in those buildings. And as we get to the point where 
everyone is consolidated. There are buildings that have uh, life safety issues or age issues that we're then able to reconsider for either decommissioning or demolishing, um, which again, saves us money in the long run because we don't have to continue to maintain the space and we don't have to worry about the asset preservation or operations of that building. And so um, we are looking very carefully at who needs space where and how we can continue to make that domino fall and, and consolidate the space across the campuses. Just a quick follow up. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, mean, I appreciate that. And uh, I must, you know, made the safe assumption that, of course, if they're on this slide, there's been process um, up to this point. But just thinking about the Twin Cities campus and Pike Gym and Pike Hall in particular, yep. um, without getting too narrow, you know, those are such um, uh, critical pieces of property, especially when it comes to the the um, area of Dinky Town and some of the off-campus areas that we talk about a lot, and um, it seem, you know, seems to be some opportunity there. And so I guess um, wanted to get the broader question about uh, space consolidation and getting more information on that. I guess um, I'm also, this is the first time I'm realizing we're taking first steps to fr demolish those buildings. So I'm personally interested in that, but we can talk more about that um, later because um, I think that's significant and um, could it have some good opportunity for those. Um, it, it's just so physically relevant to a lot of the things we talk about related to um, Dinky Town and our off-campus area. So um, other than that, this is I think this is a great approach to the legislature for our state capital request. So thanks. Thank you, uh, Regent Farnsworth, Senior Vice President Franz. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, uh, Regent Farnsworth. I think one of the things that uh, I go back to a lot, and I think a lot of us do, is the 2021 capital plan, the Twin Cities capital plan, which lays out really the long-term sort of visions. Where are those corridors of interest, you know, for example, the core that we talk a lot about on the campus, how critical it is to maintain the core of campus here on the East Bank and on the West Bank to make sure there are student-facing buildings for teaching and research and, and all the right things happen there for students. But we also have mapped out in that campus plan some goals toward um, the, the, the historic Knoll area in terms of what are the priorities over there, which some of the, where some of these buildings are located. So. Um, so there, there really is a long view of where we are trying to take, and that takes into account obviously East Gateway, which will have another of different effect on how we consolidate and move, um, move uh, pieces around. But as uh, Vice President Roberts Davis mentioned, it is like a, a chessboard, and you, you have to be moving three or four different pieces at the same time. Uh, yeah, we recently came to the board um, I don't forget what month it was, uh, uh, several months ago, about the uh, Pike Hall and the gymnastics gym that we wanted to uh, take that down after the women's gymnastics moves to the new building that we'll be uh, looking at today on the consent report. So these processes are, are frankly almost too long sometimes in terms of timing, but they're very transparent. We really try to make sure that all interested parties, especially the board, sees these pieces as, as they're moving. Another place where you see this show up a lot is the strategic planning group that we have, and we'll be uh, convening that group again, so, or, and the reporting on sort of the strategic property decisions about acquiring or get, getting rid of certain land and how we go about doing that. So that also, I think, helps guide the discussion to make sure people know what sort of um, assets are on the discussion table. But you're right, we need to make sure people see that and hear it. I think I was late that day, so I remember this now. So I'll own it. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. No, no, I'm owning it for everything. Glad Thanks. someone Thanks. did. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, June Representative Yang. Thank you, Chair Hipshen, members of the board, and um, Vice President Robert Davis. I just have a quick logistical question about one of the projects in development on page 22 of the docket. Um, I think on line three, we talk about the Middlebrook Hall dining renovations that are starting, and, or are, where we are currently in the project design phase. I was wondering if we have any alternative um, modes of food access for the students, because I believe that Middlebrook Hall is one of the only dining halls on West Bank. Go ahead. Uh, Chair, yep. thank you, Student Representative Gang. Um, that'll be a phased, pro uh, phased project, and so the dining hall will remain open during that project. It'll be probably two summers that'll take place over, and so you won't have any um, lack of dining op options. Thank you. thank you. Does that get to your question? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Hips. 
First, um, I support the Heaper only request. I think that's um, prudent. Uh, second, I like hearing that we're using that uh, asset assessment system that we changed policy for last year. And so you'll see that if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and third, in follow-up to Regent Farnsworth's discussion about space consolidation or footprint reduction, um, remind me, um, does HEPA or is there a legislative mechanism that pays for demolition? Because that is very, very expensive. Uh, go ahead. To your hip, yes. um, Regent Davenport, generally demolition is not paid for through HEPA dollars. Oh. Thank you. Second your question. Any follow up? Oh, on uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Regent. Yeah, you'd have to be pretty creative to come up with taking down a building and saving part of it to build it. I mean, it's just, it would be really virtually impossible to do. A lot of the capital bonding dollars often uh, don't allow for um, for demolition either. So it, it really is unfortunate because there's sometimes that's one of the things you have to do to get a project moving, and, and that can be expensive. You're right. Very. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, that concludes the, uh, the questions. I just want to chime in, and I'm all for this heaper uh, request as well. I think, uh, I think we have to acknowledge what the real costs are to running a college, including uh, depreciation and repairs. And, and everybody wants to fund the new grand projects, but we have some old stuff to take care of that we need to take care of just to run our business here. And I think that the legislature should be receptive to this. I don't know. But I mean, we, we're only getting a percentage of our heaper dollars, so we keep putting more and more uh, backed up on it. I know roads are doing the same thing in every, you know, every county courthouse. And so um, I re really respect this uh, process and I hope it's good luck. So, okay, moving along uh, to the third item. It's, uh, is our next item is review of the interim president's recommended supplemental fiscal year, fiscal year 2025 state budget requests. Uh, Interim President Ettinger, Senior Vice President Franz, and Vice President Thompson will take us through this item. Uh, Interim President, would you like to get us going? Thank you. Very much so, Chair Hipsch. Um, as Vice President Roberts Davis mentioned in her remarks in the previous section, we engaged in a very deep and successful consultative process this summer that was designed to get input from the university community on priorities for the capital budget request to the state and for a potential supplemental operating budget request. We are very appreciative of the additional funding the state provided the university in the current year toward our core mission and in several more targeted initiative areas. However, as the board well knows, the state did not fund any of our requests for additional dollars in fiscal year 25. We continue to face cost increases that would have to be addressed by the only means available without growing state support. And those would be either higher tuition revenue or more extensive internal budget reallocations or both. As you will see in this presentation, we are proposing to take that same request for core mission support back to the state this upcoming session. Let's start this conversation by turning the presentation over to Senior Vice President Franz and Vice President Julie Tonneson, and we will then be happy to engage in further discussions after they get through the materials. Turning back to you, Chair Hipsch. Okay, and we'll turn it over to Vice President Franz. Thank you, uh, Chair Hipsch, and thank you, President Ettinger. I think, uh, following up on what President Ettinger said, uh, we, uh, we do appreciate the support that we did receive for fiscal 24, uh, but uh, many of you will recall that we also had a $23 million tuition shortfall in, in this last year. Uh, that we were asking uh, for this coming year that we asked for support and did not did not get that but what we did what we do see the second biennium coming up is subject to the same pressures that we talked to you about a year ago in asking the request for the biennial budget request the governor obviously has not made a decision yet whether he'll have a supplemental budget uh, for uh, uh, fiscal 25 during the 24 session but I'm gambling or betting that he will. And I think that one of the things we want to do is uh, make our request known to the governor and to the legislature that we need this supplemental operating budget. Uh, it's important to maintain the core funding that we have here at the university that Vice President Tonneson will talk about. And these are, these are really important consequential decisions for our students 
and the success of the University of Minnesota. So, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it over to Vice President Tonneson, if that's all right. Sure. Good afternoon, Chair Hipsch and members of the committee. I think you'll see that this supplemental request proposal aligns very closely to the uh, capital request that you just heard about. But today we are bringing for your review a proposal for a supplemental state budget request. It is a direct result of actions that the state took or didn't take uh, last session. This proposed supplemental request is simple. We would like to resubmit to the state of Minnesota our request for a $45 million incremental increase in our O&M appropriation for next fiscal year, FY25. As you recall, for consideration during the last legis legislative session, you approved a biennial request that included a number of components. While some of those components address more specific needs and costs, two of them were in direct support of the core operating needs of the university. I'll go more into more detail in some upcoming slides on what we mean when we say core operating needs. But first, I want to refresh your memory on what happened related to that portion of our request. For FY24, the first year of the biennium that started just this last July 1, we asked for a $45 million increase in our own O&M appropriation for core mission activities and a $24 million increase to address the FY23 tuition revenue shortfall compared to budget. These two items combined reflected a $69 million recurring budget challenge for us. Toward that portion of the request, the state provided a recurring $50 million, as you see in the blue on this chart. The university addressed the $19 million gap in the budget that you approved last June through tuition and other revenue gains and internal budget reductions. Our biennial request also included an additional $45 million increase to our O&M appropriation, again for core operating needs during the second year of the biennium, FY25. Toward that request, as you've heard, the state provided zero. Unfortunately, we are facing similar budget challenges to those of a year ago with projected cost increases and investment needs. Therefore, uh, we propose to advance the same request we submitted last year for a $45 million incremental increase in our recurring O&M appropriation beginning July 1, 2024. This will be a 3.3% increase in our biennial base appropriation, which is the way the state keeps track of their budgeting decisions. Instead of our current law biennial base of 1.34 billion across the two years, it would result in a biennial base of 1.39 billion. So how did we get to this proposal? We consulted. As you heard in the last agenda item, during the summer, we held three meetings with students, faculty, support, and academic unit staff and leadership. This was done in person and through Zoom, so we could ensure broad participation that wasn't based on physical location. First, we shared some information with the group on the outcomes of the 23 session, on estimated costs going forward, on the components that make up a balanced budget for the institution, and so on. And then we asked them questions about priorities. What did participants feel was essential to address in the budget, and how those priorities could best align with the interests and goals of the state? We asked people to think about the questions and offered them opportunities to submit their thoughts back to us through email and or to share their ideas in small group and full group discussions. This was combined with that capital budget pro proposal process, so we actually had some very lively conversations and we learned a lot from each other. In the end, the themes that emerged most prominently through this process are those that you see here. We need to focus on the needs of students, both in terms of services that could be strengthened or enhanced as students' circumstances continue to involve, evolve and in terms of the cost of attendance. Second, we need to acknowledge and support the needs of our faculty and staff, particularly around issues of compensation, both to retain the highly skilled and experienced people we have and to attract new talent in alignment with our strategic goals. And third, we have been and want to remain a real economic driver for the state. We educate the state's future workforce in ways that are complementary to what Minnesota State does. We create businesses, we deliver entertainment, we employ a great number of people in meaningful work, both directly and indirectly through the goods and services we purchase and so forth. We need to foster those benefits to the state wherever we can and help people see the link between the work that we do and the state's thriving economy. 
after contemplating those themes and then the conversations we had also had around the best way to approach this next session, we decided that focusing on this very simple and direct request, consistent with what they heard from us last year, had the best chance for success. It is not the biennial request year. It is technically the, quote, off year for the operating budget. What we learned this summer is helping us build the arguments for this supplemental request and the way we will present it, and is also helping us get a jump start on planning for the next biennial request when we can introduce some new and exciting opportunities for state funding. Right now, coming together as faculty, students, staff, alumni, regents, and business partners to actively support our core needs will send a very powerful message. The incremental $45 million in our biennial request and now in this supplemental request is all about acting on those strong themes that came up through consultation. It is about students first and foremost. By supporting the core, we make it possible to continue to provide the world-class instruction students deserve and to provide the academic support services necessary for them to succeed in their academic goals and successfully take them to the next step whether that be continued studies or employment. It will also make it possible to provide the wraparound services to address their safety and security needs and campus life experiences, and it will even make it possible to provide the research and public engagement activities that result in unique opportunities for students to gain valuable experience. The core is about making all of these things possible. Because what these additional funds would pay for, in combination with some tuition revenue gains and continued internal cuts, are those nuts and bolts things listed on the bottom of this slide. Without the technology and the facilities and the physical equipment and supplies, the learning and the research could not happen. And most importantly, without the people, none of what we do is possible. We simply must fairly compensate our employees and work to address the many needs of our workforce. The impact of the $45 million would be meaningful. The core services I just summarized must be supported at some level. We can't just turn them all off or down. So if the state provides this support, it will allow us to do four major impactful things. One, it will allow us to implement lower tuition rate increases for students than we otherwise would be considering, therefore directly impacting the cost of attendance and working to reduce the dependence on student loans. Second, it will also allow us to better maintain services for students. Maintenance doesn't mean standing still. I think you heard a little bit about that this morning in mission fulfillment. It means continually evaluating and improving and modifying the programs and services we offer to best fit the students' ever-changing needs. But we need to fuel that continuous improvement process. Third, it will allow us to meet more of the demands we have related to our spaces and our physical environment. Our efforts to reduce our physical footprint continue, as you just discussed, but we will always have classrooms, libraries, labs, offices, and gathering spaces, and those must be safe, functional, sustainable, and accessible, while being very conducive to excellence in teaching, learning, and research. And finally, this $45 million will support our efforts to fairly compensate our employees. Employee groups came together recently to request a variety of enhancements to pay and working conditions and benefits, and the university is taking those requests seriously. We will be working together with the employee groups to build a shared understanding of those priorities to develop options and determine the implications of moving forward with various changes. You will be hearing more about those options and ideas throughout this academic year, but it starts here by understanding that receiving this $45 million in new funding from the state will help to make implementation of any of the proposed enhancements that much more possible. Supporting our core operating costs, our core mission activities is truly supporting the heart of the university in so many ways. And so with that, Mr. Chair, we do ask for your consideration of our proposal for this supplemental budget request. Uh, thank you, Vice President Tonneson. Um, are there any discussion or questions? Mr. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, Chair Hipsch, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I guess my question would be, um, you know, looking at that we're gonna be, we're kind of rolling, rolling our core mission uh, support request over from last year um, is, you know, just trying to get a little bit more at um, beyond, 
beyond how we present it, because I think with our strong um, new hire, with our exec new executive director of government relations and some other things, like I think our approach and our presentation, I'm confident, is going to be better. Um, but, you know, I get a little um, nervous, you know, understanding what happened last session, hearing we're going to kind of roll over the same thing. And so, um, you know, just maybe elaborate a little bit more on besides approach and um, engaging more regents and students and faculty and um, putting, the, you know, that core mission front and center that we're requesting funds for at the legislature. Um, you know, what else are we going to be changing up in terms of approach um, to um, hopefully get a different outcome, um, understanding that we're using, you know, so we're putting something in front of the legislature that um, may be familiar. And there's it, this is nuance, and I know I'm, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but I think you probably understand what I'm getting at. So thank you. Uh, Vice President Donison. Sure. Um, Chair Hips, Regent Farnsworth. Uh, you, you're right, a lot of the quote change will be in the delivery or the approach of the request, but I think it's also important to understand that they did support this request. They gave us $50 million in the first year of the biennium specifically for core mission. So I think there was some, and uh, Senior Vice President Franz may have different thoughts, but I think there was support for the general idea of taking care of the core and understanding that we do have cost increases. I honestly believe that in some respects, and I've mentioned this before, but they, the way that the state does their budgeting, they provide the funding in the first year and they have to hold down the second year. If that wasn't the case in that biennial uh, view of the world, I think there could have been additional support for us in the second year for this item. So that's my, my personal opinion is I think that actually um, we were caught in, in that practice uh, if you will, and that there will be support if they have the funding within the within the forecast and within their targets to provide us um, additional dollars. So that's my thought. Thank you, uh, Vice President France. Uh, yeah, thank you, Vice President Tonneson and uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Regent Farnsworth. I think the other thing, <clears throat> this in October, I think in late October, we're going to have a higher education hearing in the House, um, and uh, we'll have I think even another one in the House in January, even before the session began. So I know that there's an interest in President Ettinger and I met with uh, <laughs> Chair Pulaski seems like a long, long time ago, but it was just a month or so ago, and um, to talk about the approach and how can we best provide the information that the, the committee needs. Uh, and Chair Pulaski runs a really um, strong um, committee in, in terms of budgeting and understanding budget. So he, he really wants to make sure that he fully understands not only our budget, but what, what, what are we doing to implement the core services that we ask for. He wants to know about how that's going, which is, makes a lot of sense. But we also want to talk about why this is important for us going forward. So I think uh, along with, um, as you mentioned, our new hire um, executive director, Melissa lopez France, and I think with establishing a new team and, and hitting the, this fall um, and uh, getting all these uh, committee hearings lined up in a way with uh, Vice President Tonneson and her <coughs> budget presentations, I think a lot of what we'll be able to do is set this up in a way that um, is very positive and supportive. And like, like uh, Vice President Tonneson was talking about, the fact that they had reduced tails in their budget just made it difficult for them to, to deal with our second year. And so we just want to give them the opportunity to make that right. <laughs> Follow up. Just a quick follow-up. No, I think that, that those answers are great. I think I was getting caught up and didn't phrase things exactly correctly with the um, concept of um, reduced tails, the biennium, what that means. And so those answers were good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, student Representative Groshaw. Thank you, Chair Hips, Vice President Tunnison. I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, page 59, the budget planning process. How are students invited, chosen to represent themselves in these meetings? Uh, Vice President Tonneson. Uh, Chair Hips, uh, Student Representative Groshong. Uh, the students actually, it comes about in different ways. Often they approach us, 
Uh, so through the governance process, so the student government groups will approach us and ask for presentations and information about the budget. And we're always very happy to go and talk to whoever wants to hear uh, about the budget, the university's budget overall, and our request. So that's, that's one. Their participation in the other existing governance structures is a second. So there are students, for example, on this um, Senate Committee on Finance and Planning uh, and those uh, other groups that here regularly get input from us on, in fact, that will be part of our next agenda item to talk about that a little bit, to get input on from us on what we're thinking and also to gather input back from them, again, through those structured groups, primarily. Go ahead. Uh, Chair Hips um, and uh, Student Representative Grossberg? Gr Grossholm. Yeah. Grosshock. Uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, and I'm, rem I'm remembering in the meeting we had uh, student representative Yang, I think it was like March or February of this last year, where the student representatives and, and I, we were talking about this process and a number of issues, and, and one of them was this budget process. And this the schedule is really not really suited well for student participation because the most vigorous part of our outreach is during the summer. <clears throat> and that's when the student representatives, including student representative Yang, made it clear that uh, if asked, we will attend, and they did. And so I think that was one way that we also tried to promote and foster this uh, outreach during the summer. I mean, we faculty who were off for the summer attended, staff and uh, student representatives. So it was, it's a challenge because of the nature of the timetable, because we have to submit, uh, in a budget year, we have to submit our budget request by October 15th, usually to a management budget at the state, in order for it to be part of the consideration this year is a little different because there's no budget requirement. So we had some flexibility, but we thought, well, let's do it at the same time we're doing the state capital request and use uh, everyone together. So this summer it worked really well, and, and thanks in part to uh, student representative Yang and her other colleagues for pressing us to open that door, which we gladly did. And we really appreciated the, the participation this summer. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up? Uh no, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Regent Verhalen. Thank you, Chair Hipsch. Um, this is actually a tail on question to what Senior Vice President Franz just mentioned about the hearings um, this fall and then likely again in January. And the first bullet on the slide in front of us is limit tuition increases for students. And to your point about providing information to the legislature about what these things mean and not only what are we doing with what are we doing and what have we done with our core mission, with the money that we received last year? But what would we be doing and what impact would these dollars have going forward? Um, being able, as well as we can, knowing all of the variables that go into this, quantifying something like that and a bullet point like that, I think will go a long way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any comment? Yeah. Or no? no, thank you. Anybody else have any discussion or questions? If not, we're going to take a 10 minute recess. So, which will probably turn into 20 the way we do things, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a judgment on the chair. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, we're calling the meeting back to order of the Finance and Operations Committee. Our fourth item starts our process to develop uh, the fiscal year 2025 annual operating budget. Today, uh, Vice President Tonneson will provide us with an overview of the university budget model. Senior Vice President Franz, would you like to introduce the item? Mr. Chair, yes, I would. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Chair Hepps and members of the committee, we wanted to be the opportunity to begin this year's annual budget process by providing an overview of the current process and budget uh, model that we use to give that we use to create our current uh, recommended budget annual budget that we bring to you for your review and action every year. The university's budget is large and complex, as you all have learned. To address all the factors that go on in creating it, we have a very robust process. The presentation we have for you today. We'll dive into the details of how we think about the budget, the process timeline, the roles of different stakeholders, and the factors we use to aid in decision making. This information, we hope, will provide a solid understanding and aid our work this year as we build the budget. And our budget conversation continues throughout the year, and Vice President Tonneson will talk a little bit about how these different points will come before you as a board. So with that, uh, Chair Hips, I'd like to, uh, Vice President Tonneson to Take, make the presentation. Thank you. Go ahead, Vice President Tonneson. Thank you, Chair Hips, members of the committee. Uh, I recognize that most of you and probably all of you have heard bits and pieces of this, at least in some form. Uh, but we do think it's helpful to hear it more than once, to let it sink in a little bit, um, maybe to pick up new information and hear it a little bit differently each time. So we're going to take this, this time to give you an overview of what that process represents. I'm not going to talk about numbers. I'm not going to share with you what is the university's overall budget or anything about recommendations um, in terms of dollars. We're going to talk process and the people that are involved and so forth. So I'm going to start with um, what is actually involved in the budget process. And we're going to talk about the funds and how we think about them in the process. We're going to talk about the people that are involved and the units. And when we say unit, what does that even mean um, in terms of the budget process? So I'm going to start with the funds that are involved in the process. You've heard me say before that we do fund accounting at the university. We're required to. And that means we keep track of the money we get based on where it comes from and the particular restrictions or uh, principles around those dollars based on where it comes from. And for budgeting purposes, it's helpful to think about them in two different groups. Uh, we have what we call framework funds and what we call non-framework funds. So on the left are the non-framework funds that come to the university largely based on the work that gets done in our departments. They are generating revenues. They are working in clinics, so they're generating sales income, or they're working to get gifts, or you know, there's endowment earnings or grants and contracts. All of those things um, are generated by the work that's done in the departments. That is included in our budget. So when we bring you a budget, we're bringing you an all funds budget. Four and a half billion is everything we get from all of the sources. But those funds on the left side don't require as much leadership decision making as those on the right. They occur because of the work that gets done. We don't decide anything that, that creates that income, with this one exception of some of the rates that are approved, for example, for uh, housing and student dining and so forth. But by and large, those dollars are included in our budget process as um, part of the budget. We monitor them, we project them, we review them with the units, we have to manage them. But generally speaking, they we, the revenue we earn is what we spend. So if the revenue goes, revenues go down, they spend less, and they have to live within the resources available to them. Those that are on the right are also, they have to live within available to them, but those funds on the right, largely the state appropriations and the tuition dollars, <coughs> do rely on decisions that get made in the budget process. These. We, re we decide how much money to request from the state of Minnesota. It doesn't just happen, right? We have to make a decision. We have to decide about the tuition rates and about our enrollment numbers. We have to make decisions that generate that revenue. 
And with that, we then have to decide how to invest those dollars as they come in. So that is where we focus a lot of our budget process is on the state dollars and the tuition, the process itself, because that's where we have to make a lot of the decisions. So as we talk about this, hopefully that will become uh, more apparent to you how that works. And it's also important, I think, to understand that, that that piece of the budget is our largest discretionary set of dollars, and it's also a significant amount of our budget. It's about 40% that comes from the state appropriation and tuition, and those dollars are used to support all of our mission. It, it, it's a three-part mission, instruction, <coughs> research, public service, but it also supports student aid, and it supports all of the overhead. So we can do essentially anything legal with those dollars within the institution, so the really fun, exciting things, as well as the more mundane things we have to take care of every day. It's extremely important um, dollars in the budget. I'm going to jump to the people as part of our annual budget process who's involved. And it starts really with the president. The president is the one that starts our planning process by making some preliminary planning decisions, planning assumptions around big budget variables. And these are things like what should we ask for from the state? How much tuition revenue should we try to generate? What should we plan for an investment pool? What should we plan for overall compensation cost increases and so forth? Those decisions are made through consultation with leadership and others, um, but again, at the beginning of the process by the president. Then the president has delegated to what's called the budget committee within the institution, the budget process. And the budget committee right now is the provost, Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, myself, the Vice President for Research, the Vice President for Equity and Diversity, the Vice President uh, for Clinical Academic Affairs. And the six of us take those planning assumptions as part of the beginning of the budget, turn them into budget instructions that we then deliver out to our units. The units receive those budget instructions. They have to respond to them, and that's the chancellors, the deans, the vice presidents, and how they involve their departments is up to them. It's a very distributed budget management system. They have, might have elaborate processes inside of their unit to develop their budget, or they might have a simpler model. But regardless, the, how they involve their departments is up to them. But they respond to us through that budget process. They respond to the budget instructions. We then listen, we meet with every one of them every single year and talk, and we'll talk more about this, meet with them, and through an iterative process, work with the president on what we ultimately want to bring to you uh, to review and act on in terms of a recommended budget. That's the, the, the structure for how we build um, the process uh, to develop that, that final budget. Along, along this whole continuum, you'll see there's consultation. And as I started to mention earlier relative to the question here, uh, we actually do meet with groups throughout the year internal to the university to talk about the planning assumptions as they happen throughout the year, but to also talk about uh, what's happening at the state, anything that would impact the budget. We bring people in to get their input. And that's through the governance process, but it's also we meet with every one of the chief financial managers of every unit once a month. Uh, they then meet with their deans. We meet with the deans and the chancellors uh, several times during the year specifically about the budget uh, and how it's being developed. So there's consultation throughout this process on how we are developing and thinking about the budget. The units, when I talk about unit, this is what I'm talking about. There's roughly 50 what we call resource responsibility centers. These are the Twin Cities colleges, including the Experiment Station and Minnesota Extension that you see on the left and also each of the system or greater Minnesota campuses. Those are considered our academic units. The support units are those listed on the right. These are the major um, support, uh, <laughs> by title, uh, the support units that, that actually serve the institution, uh, most of them. Some of them have an asterisk next to them because for purposes of the budget process, either in whole or in part, they are treated just like a college or a campus. Um, so. 
Twin Cities Athletics is a good example of that. That is not a support unit. It's not an academic unit. It's treated um, in the process just like a college. They have to go through the process just like a college would. So those are the units. And when I talk about meeting with each of them, this is what I'm talking about. We meet with all 50 or 51 of them uh, every single year. And they are unique. And this is important to understand, too. They are not all the same. So when we bring a budget to you, it is actually a rolled up budget after we work at this level. So what you see here, uh, to il illustrate some of this, are the academic units. Uh, the Twin Cities Colleges and Extension and the system campuses uh, and the Experiment Station. And what this chart shows is a couple of things. One, it shows that every single one of them, first of all, has some of that neon green color. They all get some state appropriation. So there is no unit here that does not. The other thing it shows is their size. They are not all the same size. We don't budget by size. We budget by uh, reporting line, if you will. So we have a very large unit in the medical school. And it goes all the way down to the experiment station, our smallest unit at $15 million. It also shows you that they are dependent on different forms of revenue. So the medical school, for example, on the bottom is not very dependent on tuition. Is it important to them? Yes but they are not as dependent on it as the College of Liberal Arts on the Twin Cities campus or the Duluth campus or the Carlson School of Management, where when we have an enrollment issue, that can be very significant for those units. And they also care differently about different issues. So uh, the School of Public Health, for example, is highly dependent on sponsored research and the indirect cost recovery revenue that comes with that. And if something happens to that, they have a major budget issue. Not so much for the law school. They're not dependent on that. So it really does vary in terms of the opportunities and the challenges that each one of these units have. So when we meet with them, we're trying to work with their unique circumstances to understand what will make them successful. And then we have to build all that up and add it all up, and it has to balance when we bring it to you. So this is the level at which we hold those conversations because of that, because they are so unique um, and really have different challenges and opportunities. So the budget process and the timeline and the framework. So let's talk about the budget process. You are a part of all of this. We have two budget processes, really. We have the biennial budget request to the state, and we just talked about one piece of that in the supplemental request. But every two years, we bring a large request to the state for those state dollars that you have to help us decide what to ask for uh, from the state as part of that. Then every year within that, we have to do an annual budget. So we don't just do the state piece. We have to do an annual budget. And it all starts in the summer of an even-numbered year when we create what we call the budget framework. So again, this is focusing on the state and tuition dollars and those really large variables. Our budget is done based on an assumption, uh, and an accurate one to date, that our base budget, when we approve it, is balanced. The revenues equal or exceed the expenditures. So when we do our budget planning for the next year, we don't do a zero-based budget for every one of these units every year. We instead do incremental budget planning. So we're going to look at what is the incremental revenue changes and the incremental expense changes that we need to plan for. And in that black box, that's where we decide for planning purposes at that point in time, what do we want to ask for for an incremental change in state dollars? What do we want to plan for in incremental tuition dollars? What do we want to plan for incremental compensation costs, for program investment increases, and for all those costs that we know we're going to have, the, the sort of unfund things, right? The fringe benefits and the utilities and the debt and so forth. And all of that has to balance. That's called the budget framework. And that guides. What we ask for, so when we ask for money from the state, we can't do it in isolation. It's in the context of all those other variables. Um, Regent Verhalen mentioned when we go to the state, we have to be able to say, what does this request mean to tuition? We have to, to answer that question, we have to build out this plan and this framework. And so that's what we do in the black box. And then in the 
the fall of the even numbered year, so a year ago, we bring to you what we want to recommend as a request to the state of Minnesota. We do that in September and October. We submit the request in October. It goes through the governor's process. It then goes through the legislative process. And we don't find out what our appropriation is <coughs> until May of that odd numbered year. Simultaneously, however, we have to be building the internal annual budget without knowing for sure what those state dollars are. But we b go back to that black box and say, what are our assumptions? That's what we're going to build the, the budget process on. So we send out instructions to the units based on those assumptions. We meet with our, all of our support units in the fall. We meet with our academic units after the start of the year, so in the February, March, April timeframe. And then when we know what our appropriation is at the end, we pull it all together. But when we get that, when we get to that point, we, we know, kind of, you know we've, got, we've done enough planning that we're able to pull it all together in a way that balances. Obviously, we're doing different modeling during all of this about what happens if. But in, in the end, we're able to pull that um, together to bring to you for review and approval in June. The second year of the biennium, is the same in terms of the annual time frame for the annual budget, but we don't have to start over generally because we know what our appropriation is for that second year of the biennium. We can tweak what's in the black box. Uh, so this is a good example this year. We know if unless they give us our supplemental request, if we submit it and they approve it, that's one thing. But if they don't and we stick with the appropriation we have, we are going to have to tweak some of what was in that black box from a year ago. We might have to cut our units deeper. We might have to do something different with tuition, with compensation, with investments. All those things we'll have to tweak a little bit. But the process runs on the same time frame. And it started actually tomorrow. We're sending out budget instructions. So it, it begins again. Um, this is an example of the budget framework. This is, happens to be from FY20 in the middle of the process in December, because we do update these as, as we learn more, as we go through the process. But this is primarily just to show you that it's very simple math. We're talking about, you know, five, six, seven, eight variables of rep resources and the same for expenditures, and the change in incremental resources has to equal or exceed the change in expenditures um, that are planned. So the, that's just an example of, of how that works. And actually, when we bring you the budget each year, there is the final recommended version of this framework is included in the budget document. So you can see it. Now, as part of this, um, there's a lot that goes into how do we get to the decisions, right? How do we actually talk about those variables, but again, by unique unit level decisions, how do we get to that? And the budget model that we have implemented here is a piece of that. We have what's called a responsibility center management budget model. Now, a budget model doesn't make the decisions, and you're gonna probably get sick of me saying that, uh, but it truly doesn't. The strategic goals and objectives of the institution guide the whole thing. So recently, Impact 2025 has guided a lot of our process and a lot of our decisions. From that, you develop your principles and your priorities uh, for the budget. What the budget model does, it's a set of decision rules, really, about taking us through the process to get to a, a final recommended budget. And I'll hopefully bring that to life a little bit here in the next slides. We have what's called a responsibility center management budget model. And that's as compared to a traditional model, which I will show you. But in an RCM, a responsibility <coughs> center management model, it's a very decentralized model. It's meant to distribute revenues and expenditures in ways to units that actually incent behavior, that incent them to grow revenues, incent them to control costs where they can. And it is tends to be, and is here, a very transparent budget process. So when we go through the consultation process in all of its forms, we share a lot of information uh, so that people understand the revenues and they understand the costs inside the institution. Why we went that way, we actually implemented over a very long period of time. We started in 1998, did a most recent update in 2007. So we, since that time, we've had a very stable model um, 
uh, I won't go into how that all gets reviewed and that we'll be reviewing it again. Just know that it has been around for a while. And it was created at a time when people were worried about the decline in state funding. And so there was this notion that if we went to this type of model, it would really help people do those two things, grow revenues and control costs. Uh, and do it in a way that helps them understand what their decisions mean in the budget process. A traditional higher ed budget model is on the left. And in a traditional model, the state appropriation, the indirect cost recovery revenue, and the tuition revenue all gets commingled at the highest level of the institution. The colleges and the campuses don't see it. It comes to the president, and every year the president and his leadership team decide how to allocate that commingled pot of money out to all of the campuses and the colleges and the support units on an incremental basis plus minus. You can do a very good budget in that model. There's no perfect budget model ever. If anybody says there is, they're, they're wrong. Um, <laughs> I just don't know how else to say it. There is no perfect budget model, and everyone is always unhappy, which then means you kind of have the right model if everybody's sort of equally unhappy. Um, so you can do a very good budget model in a traditional way. We just wanted to talk about things differently, and that's really what, the, what our model does. It changes how we talk about things. And this is the simplest way I can share with you what our model looks like. On the left, you see the earned revenues. All of those are attributed in our system 100% to the academic units that generate them. So if you're teaching, you enroll students, you get the tuition revenue for that. If you are um, selling clinical services, you get that revenue. If you, if you have grants, you daily get your indirect cost recovery revenue associated with those grants. Um, you get the fees. All of that revenue goes directly to the academic units that generate them. And, and when I say academic unit, again, I'm talking about the, from our perspective, it's at the college or campus level, not the department level. Some of these revenues go to departments. Uh, course fees, for example, in art are gonna go to the art department. But generally speaking, the, the big discretionary revenues go to the, the college or the campus. In addition to that, the state appropriation in our model is allocated 100% to those same academic units. Now, if each of the academic units get all of that revenue, they have essentially 100% of the institution's revenues. They have to also have 100% of the cost. And so they use those revenues to pay for their direct costs for faculty and equipment and travel and so forth. But they also have to pay their proportionate share of university support service overhead costs. And they do that through the cost pools that you see over on the right. So when we work with each of our support units in the fall and we decide on a budget, let's just say uh, for the Office of Information Technology, when we decide on their budget, that ends up getting charged out to our academic units as a charge, as a bill, that you are gonna pay for the Office of Information Technology. You, and I'm speaking generally here, colleges, campuses have all the revenue. You have to pay for this cost. And so in arriving at that, in doing that, we consult with and, un, and share information on how those costs are changing so that the colleges and the campuses understand why their cost pools are going up. They don't like it. They'd be the first to come up here and sit by with me and say, no, they go up too much every year. Uh, but I always tell them, you know what, if we're gonna give raises to our employees, your cost pools are gonna go up. But I'll explain how, in and, and the whole scheme of things, how that works. But essentially, they, the important thing to understand is they have the revenues, they have the costs. Now, this is in combination with our decision-making process. There's formulas behind this, which I am happy to go into anytime you want to know more about the formulas, uh, and I won't bore you with that today, but there are formulas that generate these revenue and expense allocations, uh, but the formulas don't make the decisions. So what do I mean when I say that? I'll pull it all together here, I hope, on this slide. I call this the three-legged stool of resource and cost allocation, and on the, we're gonna start with the bottom leg, the central decision-making process. When I was talking earlier when, on the, the chart about the timeline, about the black box, and those decisions that get made, um, 
in terms of compensation and investment pools and tuition and state money and so forth, those are decisions that are made on the front end of the process for budget planning purposes. They have nothing to do with the model, the budget model formulas. It's decisions about how we want the institution to move forward. Those get translated then in the second leg of the stool into that framework because they have to balance. The decisions we make for incremental changes in resources have to be equal to or greater than the expense changes. That then, moves to the third leg of the stool, which is the budget, budget model. Our budget model that I just showed you is a tool that helps us translate those high level decisions down to the unit level. So we can talk about what those decisions mean in terms of impact at the unit level before we move on to deciding how, how it all comes together. So as an example, and to keep it simple, let's say that we want to um, increase, we, ha we have some additional state money, we want to increase tuition 1%, we want to do a 1% reallocation, a 1% raise, and we want to invest in uh, police officers on the Twin Cities campus, right? What the budget model does is say, okay, if I'm gonna talk to the College of Design, because of the budget model, I know what a 1% increase in tuition will generate for them. I know what their compensation costs are gonna go up if it's a 1% increase. I know what their cost pool is gonna go up for the police officers, right? Because the formulas tell me all these things. I know what a 1% reallocation will generate in terms of resources for them. And then we look based on those framework decisions at that unit and say, do you have enough incremental resource change to cover your costs or do you not? And last year's a good example. Nobody did until we had the, until you, pull in that state money, that $50 million we got. Then we were able to cover the rest of the, the costs in general. But let's say we didn't get state money. Do we have enough resource there to cover their cost increases? If we do, maybe we have extra. Maybe then we say, okay, let's invest it in faculty in your college. Let's invest it in this equipment. Or let's invest it in the other priorities that you bring forward. If there isn't enough resource, Maybe we say to them, you have to cut your budget deeper than we originally thought. You're gonna to have to find expense reductions. And in the extreme, we can move the state money around. We haven't done that for a number of years, but the model does allow that. So think about it in terms of if we got a cut in state funding, do this math to see who's impacted where and how can we adjust the state dollars to arrive at what we hope is a, the most successful result for each unit. So the budget model is what helps us with the start of that conversation, but it doesn't make the decisions because we do have to come in at the bottom end and say, okay, yeah, you do have to cut more. Or, oh, okay, you don't have to cut maybe more, but we're gonna give you more state money. Or maybe, you know, you're, we're gonna give you this investment and not that investment and so forth. So it, it helps us get to a place where we can talk about those decisions that have to be made at the unit level that align with what's happening at the institutional level so we can pull it all together uh, in our recommendations to you. How that happens, and this, I'll do this one very quickly, but essentially in the fall, when we meet with each of the support units, those are the things we talk about. What's the compensation cost increase gonna mean for you? What other priorities do you have in terms of adding your services or improving or enhancing your services or maintaining them? Um, and, and that could be an academic um, focused service, it could be more of an infrastructure focused service. On the support unit side, remember they don't get the revenues, so the tools we have to solve their budget problems is we can ask them to cut and we do ask them to cut deeper. There, is, there were some that had earned revenues and there's still always that opportunity perhaps, but there isn't a lot of that. But the third thing is then if we don't wanna cut them deeper, we say, okay, we're gonna add it to the cost pool charges to the colleges. Because when we get to the college side and the campus side, we talk about the same things, compensation, academic priorities, infrastructure needs, but now we have to talk about the impact of the cost pools because they're paying for you know, my compensation increase in the budget office. I don't have revenue to pay for that. They're paying for it, it goes into the cost pool. But there's, this is where the tools are on the mm -hmm. academic side. This is where the state money goes, this is where the tuition goes, this is where the other revenues go. They still have to cut too, but this is where we have more ability to um, cover the costs and make those decisions. 
This is an example um, from the College of Biological Sciences in FY22 of an actual framework result at the end of the process. This was kind of a wild year coming out of the pandemic, uh, but we had tuition revenue. You can see the reallocation was very high that year at 2.5%, uh, and they got a little bit of an increase in O&M. And that $1.9 million incremental change in framework resources then was going to pay for the decision we made on compensation, the cost pool increases. So again, if we're doing a raise, their, their cost pools are gonna go up, or if we're investing in services, they're gonna go up. We also had almost a million dollars of new investment for that college that year in the strategic plan out of those dollars, and they had to cover a small tuition revenue shortfall from the prior year. So that is an example of at the end of the process, that framework um, and how it comes to life for a particular college. This type of budget model that we have, again, has warts, uh, has benefits, and it has warts. I mean, they all do. Uh, we, ha we have to manage something. But this type of a model where you talk about um, and are very transparent about the changes in costs and the changes in revenue uh, is possible here where it might not be possible for everybody. Part of what makes our model possible is we have that relatively large unrestricted state appropriation where we can move it around if we need to do that. We are autonomous from the state of Minnesota, which means we can decide on our tuition rate, and we can and are able to carry forward our balances at the end of the year. I didn't talk about that, but that is a huge part of our budget process as well. We actively manage our balances, and that's that's considered a resource in a lot of ways. And that's a, that we're able to do that because we are autonomous from the state. We have had a leadership that has been very strongly supportive of this di distributed management style. Not all of them are in, in every institution. And we have very strong uh, personnel and data systems that we've built over time to support all of this. It sounds very um, complicated and sort of tech heavy and everything. It's clearly, it's not. Uh, but we do rely on a lot of the data that, that's out in the system. Uh, we pull data to be able to, to do this kind of uh, cost and revenue allocation. So I will stop there. That's a, a brief um, <laughs> overview of the model and the process. Again, not the numbers, uh, but the model and the process. But I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about anything I've confused you on uh, here today. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, uh, Vice President Tonneson. Okay, so first we have uh, um, uh, Regent Wheeler. Okay, Sorry. great. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Hibson, and thank you very much, Vice President Thompson, for, for your presentation, making the complex, you know, at least understandable, which is a miraculous thing. To get to the other side of simple is, is what we all desire, so thank you very much for that. I really um, want to applaud the responsibility. I have, a, I have a question, one on the unit level and one on the Uber level. So on the, on the unit level and this responsibility uh, center management, I really like it for the transparency, for the understanding of what the allocations of costs are, but also the people in the units know best their work and their priorities. So when you're closer to the work, you know that best. So I like that and the accountability that it fosters. So that's all good. I'm wondering if there are associated um, internal transfer costs that come with that, um, that come with uh, them having, you know, understanding the cost, but then is there is there a transfer back mechanism that actually increases some costs? So sometimes internal transfers, when people are paying for the costs, that causes administrative overload and costs itself. And do you have that or are you just aware of the cost, but it's not one pocket writing a check to another pocket? Uh, Go ahead. Vice Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Wheeler, a lot of it is automated. So I'm not sure if this is what you're getting at, but for example, we actually do implement this in the system. So there are places where they just talk about it and show it on a piece of paper, but they don't actually see it run through their financial reports. Okay. We actually do have it in the system. So if you were to pull a financial report for a college, it would show all of their revenues that I talked about, including the state money, and it would show all of their direct expenses plus their cost pull charges. So it's all in their financial reports. But it's automated in that we tell them your cost pulls are going to cost this amount and it's going to be taken out of your accounts based on where you budget it at this point in the year. Right. So there isn't a, there isn't a uh, sort of invoicing system. Well, that's, through automation, that's there's, uh, 
basically there's no added cost because Correct. of that. So that's Correct. great. And Correct. one more question on the Uber yeah. side. So, um, so obviously to core to our mission and the support of that mission is the staff and faculty in a huge way. And so I'm wondering in your budget committee how you work with Ken and his team on human resources because as, as I understood it from your report, uh, human resources isn't sitting right at that table. So that's you know core to our mission and also 60% of the cost, right, yes. of the running the university. How is that human resource function entered into the discussions? Uh, Chair Hips, Regent Wheeler, very good question. We have, you know, I have some very good friends in, <laughs> in the Office of Human Resources, and we uh, work together regularly to, and I pose questions to them a lot about you know, a, a, a whole bunch of different things. Yeah. And we try to share as much information as we can. And so as we go through the process, it is really a back and forth, constant kind of conversation. That initial setting of the plans is, I say, a combination of budgetary overview in terms of what, you know, looking at the resources, what we might be able to, to handle. Plus, we are part of the annual process of hearing all this consultation all the time. And so it's, it's truly a combination of being a part of that process, hearing the requests of the units, combined with the constraints we have on the resource side that come up with that original planning kind of assumption. But we work with HR um, as we're doing that. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Regent for Halen. Thank you, Chair Hipsch. Um, Vice President Tonneson, I'm looking at what's page 71 of our materials. It's the slide of the Twin Cities Colleges major academic mm -hmm. units on the system campuses. Mm -hmm. And I just had a clarifying question on the data that are on this. Yes. Um, for Duluth and Morris, respectively, our NRRI and the West Central Research and Outreach Center in, embedded in those two campuses? Uh, uh, Chair Hips, Regent for Halen, NRRI is embedded within the Duluth campus here. The research and outreach centers are actually part of two different budgets. They're part of the Ag Experiment Station budget and the CFANS budget, okay. not the campus budget. And a follow-up question on that then. So for Duluth, there's a significant state appropriation. How would this look, line look differently if NRRI were backed out of there, both from a state appropriation and an ICR standpoint? Uh, Chair Hips, Regent for Halen, I think I might have to get back to you on the dollar amounts involved okay. because there's, there's state special, O and M are, are both in the green. Okay. Um, so I, I don't know what their ICR is. I'm gonna have to, I don't know that off the top of my head. I'd have to get back to you. Understood, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, a uh, uh, Regent Mayor on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was um, uh, wanted to focus on. Can you hear me? By yeah. the way. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, also on uh, that slide seventy one. Um, so if we can turn to that for a second. Um, and this may be getting into the weeds, and I apologize for that, but um, I was struck by your presentation and the emphasis on how each college relies on uh, uh, different amounts or different categories of funding, and no two colleges or, or units are the same. I wanted to understand, and, and the medical school is probably a good example, uh, or um, College of Science and Engineering, um, I'm looking at the color charts there, and then in the medical school, to the far right, the largest component is something that, at least on my screen, is showing up as like dark navy or purple or black or something. And I'm not seeing that in the um, coding below. Yep. So I'm trying to understand. I, I do understand that med the medical school relies less on tuition and more on other amounts, but I'm trying to understand on the these various um, bar graphs, what the that yep. uh, color is to the far right, what that's representing. Yes, uh, Chair Hips, Regent Mayron, very good call. The um, navy blue is grants and contracts, and it is missing from the <laughs> key <Yep. laughs> at the bottom. <laughs> it's just missing from the key. I'm not sure why, uh, but it is grants and contracts. 
grants. Well, that would certainly make sense then for the medical school. So yes. thank you for that clarification. Yes. Yes. Just wanted to make sure I understood. Yes, I appreciate that. That's my that. only question. And I, I apologize for not catching that. Very good question. Okay, Regent Tad Johnson. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank the Vice President for an excellent <laughs> presentation of a lot of complex <laughs> material. I, I'm, and I'm almost, uh, I want to apologize for asking this, but it's a question I get all the time. It's like, uh, so I'm at UMD quite a bit and was there for 12 years. They always are like, hey, we've got nine or 10,000 students here and we, uh, we're a unit and the law school has like 750 and they're a unit. And it's like, I guess the background, what I would like to know is the background so I can explain it to them as to how we came up with the unit system and uh, is this how everybody does it? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, sure, <laughs> Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Johnson. It, uh, I think the easiest way to think about it is this: these are the units and the leaders of those units that we hold accountable for the financial activity that occurs in that unit. As an institution, we're holding the dean or the chancellor in this case um, accountable, and a lot of that has to do with the reporting line. So in the, in the case of Duluth, which is uh, sort of a unique in our system in that there is a campus and there are colleges. And, and when we set it up, it was decided that we want to hold, the president decided that uh, he wanted to hold the chancellor accountable for the financial activity of the entire campus and didn't want the budget process to go down to the college level, which would pit the colleges sort of against the campus in, the, in that uh, way of looking at it. So that is how that happened for the Duluth campus. But if you look across all of the units, whether it's a dean, a vice president, or a chancellor, it has to do with that reporting line of who they report to, the, either the provost or the president, or the senior vice president, essentially, and holding them accountable for the financial activity that occurs Great. there. Does that help? Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. OK, the, um, any other questions? I'm just wondering how inflation ties into the whole uh, budget process at this point. I mean, it's been pretty level for 20 years, but now we're starting to see some of this. Yeah. So uh, yeah. could you explain that, please? Sure. And, and I think it's, I don't know that it's unique. I have never been the budget director of a private company, so I, I can't speak, you know, very broadly. But for the way I think about it, we are somewhat unique at the university, almost like a little economy, because inflation hits our budget very differently in different places. And so there is sort of this general inflation that might be on supplies and, you know, sort of your general operations. And that we, um, by and large, ask the units to handle, essentially. We don't automatically fund it. It comes from revenue growth. It comes from internal redistribution. Where we do have specific, so the, the other big piece is compensation. So inflation on compensation comes through based on our recommendations in the budget. We decide, right, how we're going to deal with that as part of balancing the budget. And the third piece is the extraordinary inflation that hits different parts of our budget. So there might be extraordinary inflation on library materials just very unique to that unit and that function. There might be extraordinary inflation on, um, let's say, uh, gold that they use in dentistry, as an example. I mean, there's very unique cases, and what we do then is we ask the units to alert us where they are seeing those pressures as part of the budget process, and in our investment pool conversations, we can decide to provide additional funding to that unit to help them with that inflation. That becomes one of the needs out of that investment pool. So that's kind of how we generally think about it, even through the really high inflation times, is er, we think about it in those three pieces, compensation, general kind of supplies, and then the extraordinary pieces. Does that thank help? You. Yep, good, thank you. Uh, Quiet. Uh, excellent question, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Vice President Thomas. And I would just add to that, that this is something I really learned at the state at Management and Budget, and that is uh, and this is what's happened to us this year. When we have a 
budget, um, biennial budget, where we get an increase in the first year and those are recurring dollars, that's great. We appreciate that. But when there's no increase the next year, that is a cut budget because inflation will eat into mm -hmm. that budget. It just will. It, and as Vice President Tonneson said very accurately, it depends on where and how much, but it will eat into that budget. And so I think one of the things uh, that you just have to understand is a flat budget is, in fact, a budget you will end up cutting services or something to address inflation, at least in these times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're moving on to our next item here. And our next item of business is review and action of the sale of approximately 200, and I better put on my glasses, 80 acres in Rosemount at Umore Park. <laughs> here to walk us through the real estate transaction is Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger. I'll note that Regent Verhalen is recusing herself from this discussion and vote. Uh, first off, Senior Vice President Franz, anything you would like to highlight? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, one of you, as many of you know, the board in, in this particular case has spent the better part of two de decades dealing with the future of the Umore Park at, at Rosemont, Minnesota. And today we're here to present the following real estate trans transactions for your review and action today. Uh, before I uh, ask Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger to provide the overview, I want to take a moment to recognize the partnership in, involved in this effort. The City of Rosemont, Deed, Greater MSP, Excel Energy, and Dakota County were all engaged in this, uh, in this very complex transaction uh, in, at Umore Park. And I also want to acknowledge that the significant amount of time and effort that has gone into this transaction on the part of university staff under University of Services, including planning space and real estate and facilities management, the Office of General Counsel, and the College of Food, Agriculture, and Natural Resources, Natural Resource Sciences, or CFANS. This transaction has been a major lift, and I hope you will join me in thanking our teams for their tireless work on behalf of the university. Although we still have a lot of work to do uh, before we close on this transaction this fall, Seeking Regents' approval is a significant milestone for this project. And with that, I'd, I'd like uh, Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger to take over. That's good. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair Hipsch, members of the committee. As Senior Vice President Franz noted, today I present to you for review and action the proposed sale of approximately 280 acres at, of land at Umore Park. Umore Park was acquired by the university from the federal government in 1947 and 1948 after, after the U.S. War Department determined that the former Gopher, Gopher Ordnance Works was no longer needed for national security purposes. Umore Park currently consists of over 7,100 acres of land, of which 1,700 acres fall under our gravel mining lease with Dakota Aggregates, and another 2,800 acres comprises the Vermilion Highlands, which will be transitioned to the state ownership when the bonds for our football stadium are paid off in 2032. The 280-acre parcel under uh, consideration today, as located on this map in front of you, is in the northeastern portion of Umore Park. Uh, County Road 42 borders the property on the north, Audrey Avenue on the west, and Blaine Avenue on the, so on the east. The property is currently undeveloped and has been recently rezoned from agricultural use to business park planned unit development by the city of Rosemount. The property has been marketed through public processes on the university's <coughs> behalf for several years by Minnesota Department of Economic Development, as well as Excel Energy's Certified Sites Program. Per Board of Regents policy, our land acquisitions and dispositions are guided by four principles, and the, this disposition aligns with all four. The net proceeds from the sale will re, be directed to the Umore Park Le Legacy Fund, which according to Board of Regents resolution must be used to support the youth's teaching, research, and public outreach mission. The sale is in alignment with the February 2015 Board of Regents resolution, which sets the goal for Umore Park of becoming a vibrant, market-driven community for residents and businesses, reflective of private sector demand and in alignment with adjacent community needs. The proceeds from the sale provide strategic value to the university and minimize our financial liability, including supporting the development of infrastructure and utilities to the area. And finally, the sale positively impacts the city of Rosemount. The technology-based use would create economic benefit for the community and would generate proportionally low traffic volumes and low impact to city services, such as schools and public safety burden. 
The buyer for this property is Gymnast LLC, a Del Delaware limited liability company. Gymnast parent company is Meta Platforms Incorporated. The proposed purchase price is $39,720,323, which equates to the approximate value of $3.25 per square foot or $142,000 per acre. The $950,000 in earnest money and the $300,000 exclusivity payment for this transaction will be applied to the purchase price. And the earnest money is refundable if Gymnast terminates the purchase agreement before September 30th, 2023. Closing is scheduled to occur on or before January 29th, 2024. Per the purchase and sale agreement, Gymnast will be responsible for all infrastructure and utilities necessary for the development of the property. However, the university will be responsible for the cost of relocation of the university's <coughs> water line that crosses the southwest corner of the property. In addition, to the extent that the property infrastructure is oversized, expanded, or extended to serve other property, Gymnast will have the right to arrange with the city of Rosemount to cause an equitable share of that cost uh, to be assessed or otherwise payable to the owners of all applicable property benefiting that, infrastructure, that additional infrastructure, which could include the university. The property is being sold as is, where is, in its present condition with all faults. The university does not believe there are any environmental issues associated with the 280 acres and expects that Gymnast has completed any environmental investigation of the property that they deem necessary and appropriate. Given Gymnast's estimated $700 million investment in the property as reported this past week in the news, they conditioned their purchase of the property on the university's waiver of our standard procedure to reserve mineral rights when, it, when we dispose of property. Other key provisions of the purchase and sale agreement are focused on alignment with the city of Rosemount's land use and zoning requirements and the university's desire to ensure compatibility with future <coughs> development. Gymnast is acquiring the property for light industrial business park development subject to City of Rosemount entitlements. The City of Rosemount approved the plan unit development for this use in March of 2023. Per this application, the technology campus could be comprised of a couple of main function buildings and additional ancillary buildings and support areas. The uses may include servers, administrative spaces, and support equipment in a campus setting of complementary one-story buildings. The university has developed declar a declaration of covenants and design guidelines for light industrial development at Umore Park to ensure that the development of the property will reflect the goals of the university for high quality development uh, and that will ensure the value for future development in the area. While these provisions provide the university a say in the what would be developed in order to protect our future land uses, we recognize that we could not overstep standard market parameters and have a say in the how the buyer would develop and construct its facilities. Both parties have the goal of ensuring compatibility with future uses, and as a result, the agreement also calls for the university to restrict other property owned by the university as of the closing date and located within 1,000 feet of the southeast and southeast boundaries. Uh, and that those are restrictions include residential and heavy industrial uses in the future. We will work with our partners at the city of Rosemount to ensure that future plans reflect these restrictions. And with that, I conclude my remarks of, and my overview for the, of this transaction. And as Senior Vice President Franz noted, uh, ex executing an, a transaction of this nature and this magnitude has involved many partners and it has truly been a team effort. And I really appreciate all of the support that we've received. Thank you. Well, I wanna uh, thank you, Vice President uh, Krieger and uh, Senior Vice President Franz and your team for putting together this monumental task of selling this land. It's great for the U, it's great for the state of Minnesota. It's not often you can get a $700 million investment coming into Minnesota with a company like Meta. So congratulations on all that. Uh, before we turn to discussion, is there a motion to recommend approval of the sale of approximately 280 acres in Rosemount at Umore Park? So moved. Is there a second? Second. There, it's been motioned and seconded. Is there any discussion? Uh, Regent Gully, online. Hi, thank you so much. Hi. Uh, Chair and, um, and uh, everyone who has been a part of this project, I, I really appreciate um, hearing about the history and hearing about how this has come about. Um, uh, I 
do want to say I um, only became aware of this project when the docket came out this, uh, you know, for this meeting. And so I'm, I'm feeling a little bit um, like I'm catching up. But one of the things that I um, have uh, been thinking about is how this project will connect to Youngmore Park, Youngmore Park in the future and how it will integrate into whatever we dis whatever we end up doing with that property and how it will um, how it will reflect on the university and be part of this project. And um, having talked to friends in the building trades, one of the things that I learned is that. Um, so as we probably already know, the University of Minnesota, typically when we do development projects, we um, use project labor agreements. And project labor agreements are incredibly important because they protect the workers who um, work on these development sites and work on construction sites. And construction, um, the construction industry as a whole is uh, uh, and particularly outside of the skilled labor and unions tends to be very, um, can be very dangerous for workers. There's a lot of issues with human trafficking. There's a lot of issues with um, people being uh, either not, uh, either paid under the table or not paid at all and not having safety standards. And, and I feel like this project, since it's going to be effectively part of Umore Park and reflect on Umore Park, uh, it's really important that we know how this property is going to be used. And one of the things that I've learned is that through um, the sale, we can include a stipulation that requires them to use a project labor agreement or at the very least to use to uh, apply prevailing wage. And so I want to recommend that we um, that we investigate and uh, figure out a way to do that to ensure that this is a development that's done right and that's done carefully and that's done with um, protected workers and that is and workers who are safe and who are trained and uh, that it reflects the best of the university um, when we've uh, when it becomes sort of part of this community. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Vice President uh, Krieger, do you have any comments? Our senior vice first. president, fans. Uh, Chair Hipsch, uh, Regent Gully, uh, thank you for the comments. And I'll start by saying that in uh, at, uh, this, as re as uh, senior vice president Franz noted, that the university has been considering and planning for the future of Umore Park for over two decades. And originally, the university had the vision of being the developer itself and it being a university-owned property with university uh, a, a university uh, feel to it in terms of residential business research. In 2015, the Board of Regents adopted a resolution directing the university to change that direction and to disband the LLC that the university had created to be the master developer and to pursue a private sector approach to this uh, to this uh, property in terms of making private development, private sector sales and moving in that direction. And so that is the direction that we've taken since that time in 2015 based upon Board of Regents resolution. And so as a result of going the route of um, pursuing private sector development, private sales of the development, uh, we've taken away some of that control uh, and that was a deliberate decision on the university's part. From the perspective of as we try to work with um, entities uh, on sales, uh, there are certain things that we can do and certain things we can do that are within market uh, in terms of the private real estate market. And in the case of this particular property, Deed had been marketing this property and responding to RFPs on our behalf for many years. Uh, a number of different corporations have pursued that that uh, have, have considered this property. Uh, and when we came to, and when Deed, uh, when Deed responded to the RFP that we now know is from Meta, there were a number of concerns about being uh, buying from a public entity and having to make sure that we are able to think about this from a market approach and from a, you know, in terms of how do we market and to a private sector company. Thank you, uh, Vice President France. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you, Assistant uh, uh, Vice President Krieger. I think, uh, Regent Gulley, that uh, what we're really talking about here is a real estate transaction, as as 
Assistant Vice President Krieger mentioned we are not in the development business in this particular area. It's something we sort of we thought about at one point and, and have changed our our uh, scope on that. So I think one of the things that we uh, felt obligated to do was on behalf of the university to make sure that this uh, real estate sale was that. It was a real estate sale and the the licensing construction process and licensing is with Rosemont and Dakota County. And uh, we look forward to working with them to make sure that for future development occur. But we work through those entities really indeed to make sure the future development uh, coincides with university purpose. But that's what we've been trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Farnsworth. Thank you, uh, Chair Hips. Just one question. Just trying to would like a little bit more information um, on what the or the, on the Umore Park Legacy Fund and and um, what it is. That's all. Go ahead, um, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Regent Farnsworth. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. It's part of the consent calendar. But uh, the Umore uh, Park Legacy Fund uh, was established. I, I'll let. Uh, Assistant uh, Vice President Krieger talked a little bit about the history of it, but it, it's been established for a long time with no money in it, essentially. And so uh, it hasn't, we haven't had to worry about it too much. Until, I have accounts like that. Yeah, I know. I've got, I've got a bank account that looks just like that. And uh, so uh, last year, we had one of the first major sales, uh, and that was when we first uh, had some funds available. And so that's why we uh, have a, uh, an action in the consent report to ask for authority from the board to, to use that um, some of those funds. But it's been around for a long time, and the design of it was to make sure that it goes toward special uh, education and outreach uh, projects, so it's not used just for the normal operations, of, if you will, of the university. And uh, uh, so that's kind of why we'll have the consent report. Uh, but maybe you have some more information about the fund, if you would like to mention. Chair Hipsch, uh, Regents Farnsworth. Uh, yes, it was established in 2009 as part of a Board of Regents resolution related to the future of Umore Park development. And we have, as Senior Vice President Franz has noted, that for a long time there has not been any money in the fund because we've been going into deficit to pay for a lot of the environmental remedial investigation associated with Umore Park. And uh, but based upon the sale of the 435 acres for residential development, which was $13.1 million at the end of 2021, uh, as well as the mining royalties that we receive from Dakota Aggregates also goes into that fund. And so we are now actually, uh, actually have some money in the fund uh, and uh, assuming that this sale goes through but before the end of January, that that would be another, that this $39 million or the net of the $39 million would also also go into that fund. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Regent Turner. I just want to touch base before we vote on this, just a little bit on what um, Robin brought up, just because um, in the construction world, and I don't know how long it's been going on, but I know that Robin has actually been to some of these sites, these, um, uh, for want of a, mind you, it's not just a union issue. The, from the perspective I'm coming from, it's a human rights issue. That is that it's a well-known fact in the construction world that um, the uh, corporations or, or people who are building will bring people in from across the border who don't speak English. They will house them in inhuman conditions. I've heard testimony after testimony of that kind of thing. Uh, wage theft, human trafficking, um, unsafe working conditions, and. I've been assured that, you know, in potentially in like our governance and policy committee, that like us going forward, say we're going to be building more student housing, things that we would have control over, that we start to take this kind of thing seriously. Because I wouldn't want our name to be put, you know, hitched up with any of these concepts. And so um, I just wanted to just reiterate about that, that this kind of thing is very prevalent. In fact, like the Carpenters Union, they're actively trying to help these people. You know, it's not the story I heard, 30 people put into a one bedroom, one bathroom house. And that's where they all live. None of them speak English. Uh, totally exploited. And just just for FYI around here, this is very real and this is very really what's going on. And that's why these project labor agreements and just doing it right and justly is so important. Thank you. Um, any other discussion? What's that? Regent Kenyanya. Oh, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
Regent Turner, Regent Gully on that topic. Appreciate you, you know, bringing that up and for someone who doesn't know anything about that, kind of educating us. Um, just wanted to offer a reaction. Um, you know, I think that's an appropriate conversation to have in terms of, is that something we want to consider making a part of these transactions? Because we're doing real estate transactions all the time. We've done many in the past. Um, you know, we, we have different projects, well, the foundation and partnership and stuff like that. And I think that's, an, I think the diff, and maybe I'm speaking for others here, but I think the difficulty is then attaching that to a transaction that's, you know, in flight and, and really almost through. But I, I just, I just don't want to move on without like addressing because that's very real, right? And, and and I'm glad that you brought that up. And I think that it's a conversation we can put in the work plan and and to, uh, assess the relevant board and administrative policies where, where that would fit. That's just my thought. A uh, good comment. I completely agree with that. Regent Davenport. Regent Davenport. I, um, thank you, Chair Hibbs, and thank you, Regent Kenyanya, because I think it's important that we separate this transaction and this company from some general um, comments about the building industry. Um, and so I think um, it's a good idea. If it's something to address as a concept, perhaps, or as a guiding principle versus attaching it to this transaction is what I would um, agree with. I agree with that, too. Or is there any other discussion? Okay, uh, there being no further discussion, you may uh, appear ready to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. No. Okay, uh, the motion is approved. Okay, thank you all, and uh, we'll move to the next. Uh, Yeah, Cody, Cody. Can you take 10 minutes, five minutes? Just start. Okay. Right. Okay, yeah. Okay, um, our sixth item is review of a new campus plan for Duluth campus. Here to present the plan are Interim Chancellor David McMillan, Assistant Vice President Leslie Krieger, Director of Planning Monique McKenzie, Chief Sustainability Officer Shane Stennis, and Greg Havens, Principal with Sasaki. As Senior Vice President, would you like to start us off? Mr. Chair, yes, I would. As the crowd, well, chairs up there. As the crowd <laughs> assembles at the table, yes, thank you. Um, uh, this is um, a, um, an opportunity for us to really bring together some long-term planning here. I think one of the things that we've really enjoyed in the past was uh, the opportunity to get together and review these plans are so important for the long-term focus of what we of what we want to do. Uh, as we conclude our efforts at University of Minnesota Duluth, the work at Rochester is just getting underway with Morris and Crookston to follow next year. So this is part of an ongoing series that began with the Twin Cities uh, in 2021 and now with Duluth and, um, and, and going forward. I think one of the things that we want to um, to make sure that we um, uh, share also, and what was why we have Chief Sustainability Officer Shane Stennis with us today, is to make sure we talk about the interaction of our campus plans, plans with the Climate Action Plan. So with that, I'll turn, let the uh, panel begin. Go ahead, panel. <laughs> thank you, Chair Hipsch, members of the committee. Um, thank you for your time today. We're here to present the UMD Campus and Climate Action Plan as a senior vice president just represented. The documents in their entirety are included in your docket, so that's why it's such a ginormous, if I can use a technical term, <laughs> docket today. Uh, the campus plan document and the climate action plan document. So that's the very big news since we were here in June. Um, we enjoyed our conversation with you in June. We got some conversation comment from you in June. Um, and we're hopeful that you're as excited as we are to see that final product in your docket. Um, today is a review and we believe, we understand, we're scheduled in October for action. I just wanted to take a moment before we delve into the details at Duluth to remind us about our bold effort here to coordinate thinking about the future of the campus, the physical campus, both from a traditional campus planning perspective as well as climate. And part of this comes from the university strategic plan, our impact 2025 
uh, direction sets us up to do this. Um, and this fantastic diagram, which we understand is a lot to look at, is our way to try to represent how the strands of our thinking are intertwined. Right, so we need to really think in this effort as we have done starting at Duluth about the social framework, the environmental framework, the resource flows that are in our hands today and that we need to work hard on for the future and as well the economic underpinnings. So that's really the message of this diagram. Our consultant Sasaki, who has a lot of experience nationally and internationally, really is leading many of these conversations, um, helped us try to organize this so we can track each of those lenses, if you will, on how to prescribe a future, both in a near and a long-term horizon. The last thing I wanted to say at this point is just that we wouldn't have got to this stage without that incredible grassroots participation from the UMD community. Um, and that came from students, a lot of very active students, particularly on climate action and sustainability, as you might imagine. Um, it's a legacy they're gonna deal with longer than I will. Um, but also very active and involved leadership at the Chancellor's Office and throughout uh, UMD. And that is a great victory, we believe, um, in any planning process. So when people really own the process and the outcomes, we believe it, it remains a relevant um, an important uh, component of how actions will be uh, decided on in the future. And if you want just a brief summary of some of those details, they are in pages 122, 124 of your docket, just a summary of those activities. So with that, I'm gonna um, just remind us of many things I've actually just said, but that building from that 2025, Impact 2025 guidance, we are here to think about these two components of campus and climate together. Their aspirational plans on the campus side, their aspirational yet measured on the climate action, and my colleague um, Shane Stennis will speak to that. Um, these plans give us a framework. They point us to other tools we will use to implement, six-year planning, annual capital budget, specific investment schedules, some of which is directly related to your budget conversations earlier today. Um, so just a reminder of what's our purpose here and what's our intent with the prior slide. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Chancellor McMillan to keep us going. Thanks very much, Monique and uh, Chair Hipsch and members of the uh, Finance and Operations Committee. Thanks for the opportunity to be back again, visiting about something that's awfully consequential to a, uh, a place that uh, I have the privilege and pleasure uh, of leading. So I just have four messages for you before we get uh, Greg going here, our colleagues from uh, Sasaki to dig in a little bit. But one of those is just a thanks. And another is um, to bring a couple facts to life that I think will will be important as you facts about UMD as you think about what uh, what Greg's got to say and Shane following him. Then a third theme of why UMD is so consequential to Duluth and Northeastern Minnesota and uh, then I'm gonna turn it over. But thanks, um, Monique, thank you for thanking us, but the reality is we could never do something like this on our own, and, and the fact that uh, Vera and Monique and Shane and Leslie and the whole team from Sasaki have been in Duluth and been genuinely engaged across our stakeholder base, whether that's students, staff, faculty, um, leadership, the community around us, they did it and they did it uh, really well. So I'm fortunate, there's lots of people at UMD that dug in here too, and uh, so lots of thanks to them. But um, without digging back into my governance past, I can also say, and say this very genuinely, this is a very integrated approach to long-term planning, and that's a, that's a great thing. This hasn't always been an integrated approach to what ends up in front of you. And this one brings sustainability, student success, fiscal considerations, and, and long-term place-based planning to bear on a, on a set of outcomes that I think uh, provides not a, you know, a detailed roadmap, but that aspirational roadmap. So nicely done and, uh, and really good stuff. So thinking about UMD, what are we? We are primarily a place-based regional research university. And I say that and I choose my words carefully because I think as you think about and listen to what you're gonna hear and think about the, the highlights we gave you in July, that matters. Place, you know, there's lots of ways to measure place. 250 acres, roughly 50 buildings, 3.4, you know, about 10% of that 34 million square foot number that, uh, 
that uh, Myron and team were talking about earlier, those are all just numbers, but really we're a campus surrounded by residential neighborhoods and close proximity to, uh, to fairly ample commercial services and uh, two huge green spaces that show up on that map in front of you, and you know, not very far, five to 10 minute walk from campus everything overlooking Lake Superior. So when I say place-based, that doesn't mean we have failed to come to grips with a, uh, a digital marketplace around us and all that, but it is place that brings people to UMD and keeps people in Duluth, and uh, it worked for me and it works for others. So I describe it that way. Quickly, our students, 9,400, maybe 9,500 this year. Um, those <laughs> final numbers are still coming in. But, uh, you know, we can round up to 10,000. But think about students in that size and uh, 7,500 of those undergraduate, about 600 of those graduate, under 300 with our friends in the medical and pharmacy school who we host on campus. But, uh, and then about 1,100 in the PSEO and CIS world, all totaling up to that 9,500 number, which of course is down a bit, but uh, still a sizable group of people, and we provide housing for roughly a third of that total. Um, we have about 20, 1,800 dorm spaces that, uh, that, that covers most of our freshmen entering class, not all of it, but most of it, and about 1,100 apartment-style spaces all on campus. So just big numbers to think about there, but a third of our students you know, live on campus in addition to coming and going there. The rest of them uh, live close for the most part, but, uh, but not on campus. 1,700 fa uh, faculty and staff at UMD. So there's another number to keep in mind as you think about this. And this gets me into that point I wanted to make about this is a very, very, very consequential place in, uh, in northeastern Minnesota and Duluth. You know, 10,000 students, 1,700 employees, about 4,000 indirect jobs that come in one shape, a form or another that uh, may not be employed by us, but have jobs because we're there. And that all totals up in the eyes of our Leibovitz School uh, economists to about $600 million annual impact year after year. And uh, that's a big number. So major economic engine for the region and a major hub for uh, arts, theater, music, athletics, history, culture. We're a big player in that space. And I, when I told you we're a regional research university, research is another wing of UMD's operations, some 70 million and climbing in sponsored research funds. And if you took all the rest of the research universities other than the R1s, i.e. Madison, Milwaukee, and the Twin Cities were bigger than every other university combined across those two states. So that matters, that gets us into the outreach space, uh, land grant and a sea grant university, which is unusual. NRI came up in the last conversation, Glenn Sheen, um, those are all places people think about in Duluth and associate and should associate with UMD. So the last one I would hold up for you is that we're also a major force in workforce development and our presence there is critical. That ties in directly to the education mission and back into the number of graduates that, uh, that we put into the, world, into the marketplace every year, you know, 22, 2300. So, Big place with lots of consequence for that part of the world. Um, Shane's going to dig into some of these details, but I'll close on the thought that uh, our carbon footprint is down, closing in on 30% over 15 years. I think that's impressive. Um, our energy consumption's down more than 20% over that same time frame, and uh, this plan sets us up to continue to excel and do really well in uh, that in that marketplace. So. I'll come back and make a few closing comments, but that's how I think about this plan and the context in which uh, I'm proud to uh, be sitting in front of you today. Greg? Great. Well, thank you, Chancellor. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, I'd like to start with giving you a bit of background on key drivers for where we are today at, U at UMD. Some of those things that have informed the development of this plan, and there's some very important aspects, uh, certainly around campus life, the way we're supporting students. As the Chancellor noted, we have a sizable residential population, 35% or so of undergraduates live on campus, but a sizable population lives off campus. 
leading to some of the needs that have been identified, Pl finding places and programs to engage those students, uh, finding ways in which the, we can really provide inclusive spaces for them, casual lounge spaces, other ways they can engage with the university. Through this process, too, we've also identified some significant needs around dining expansion. Uh, dining was constructed prior to a growth in, in the student population, so we need to think of that moving forward. The fitness facility is um, inadequate for the current population, so that becomes a major goal in this plan. And of course, increased fitness services are needed across campus, and you'll see outcomes for that in this plan. Recommendation here is for a new health services facility to address those needs, as in, and you'll see shortly the idea of an expanded dining facility and various ways in which fitness and recreation can be embedded in the plan. We're also looking to climate projections. This is a long-term view. We're looking out to 2050 and beyond. Uh, the climate models and what they suggest for Duluth, climate change is already present. We've seen that in the decrease in the average ice cover on Lake Superior. But the models predict that we are going to see increases in average temperature, more hot days, uh, a shorter winter, which might be welcomed, and an increased frequency of an intense flooding events, rainfall mm -hmm. events. All of those things we want to bear in mind as we look to the future of the campus. And we want to adopt in infrastructure strategies that enable us to be more resilient and to address these needs. One thing I'll point out as a result of this plan, we have about 34% impervious area on campus today. If this plan follows, is followed through, we'll have around 29%. So those measures to increase the ways in which we can manage water on campus are key to this increased rainfall that we may see over the years ahead. We're also looking to your greenhouse gas emissions. As noted, uh, there's been a sizable decrease in greenhouse gas emissions over the last 15 years. That's uh, commendable and uh, something simply that's embedded into this plan as we look forward. How do we continue on that trajectory of downward uh, and, and uh, downward decline and the way in which energy is used and the greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with it? What we do know from this process is the heating and cooling on campus combined with the electricity consumption represent around 90% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So those became the key focus areas here. The scope one being what you do on campus. Scope two is what you buy from the electric power grid. And then scope three is associated with the commuting and movement on campus. Those all are very important to the way in which we view the future and the way in which we're going to reduce the 41,000 or so metric tons of CO2 equivalents that were emitted in 2021. So uh, all part of our targets moving forward. The plan was also informed by the students themselves and the community and what we heard from the community. And Monique will explain some of the outcomes of our survey process. Thanks, Greg. I just wanted to take a moment with this data because we didn't get a chance to show you this in June. This is a great tool Sasaki has developed through its work with us and in other campuses to really make a very, uh, I'll say, crowdsourced picture of the geography of campus. What does campus mean? Different locations on campus, um, broad invitations by email through the project website. We get great responses. We use a similar tool at the Twin Cities. We had about 700 people um, in Duluth responding to this. They put about E, almost 8,000 markers down about places they care about or they think should be improved. So what you see here on the mapping is just color coding. We have only selected some of the responses, but it really gives us a chance to pick up some granular details that we don't see either as staff from Twin Cities or consultants. And it, you'll see, <coughs> even from these comments, how many of these comments and these findings directly reflect on some of our recommendations. So we'll return to the recommendations and I think you'll see an, uh, an echo to that, but just wanted to spend a moment telling you about this tool. We look forward to using it at all of our campus sites. So the campus plan itself is based on four big ideas that are intended to be integrated in nature. They are addressing those many issues that Monique identified at the beginning of the presentation. Looking for ways in which we can interconnect those ideas in a way that leads to uh, solutions to problems that are multifaceted. Uh, the big ideas that uh, there are four that I'll go through here, the first being uh, a sustainability corridor. Now, what do we mean by that? At the very heart of the UMD campus is Kirby Drive. It is uh, the center of the transportation network. It is the very heart of the campus. Right now, it's very utilitarian in nation, nature. 
the intent moving forward is to use that as a landscape, a circulation corridor that will connect to the Bagley Nature Area and Huntley Park to the north and connect to Chester Park on the south. The intent is to connect the campus itself with those regional or citywide resources and to bring more of that type of expression into the heart of campus. That corridor itself is at two levels, Kirby Drive being lower and an upper level, which is currently occupied by Vermilion and Burnside residence halls. Those are slated to be removed in this plan, thereby uh, opening up an opportunity for a new expression at the heart of campus. At its very heart is the Superior Dining Hall that is also the subject of a renovation and enhancement in this plan as the heart of campus for both commuters and for resident students. The intent though overall is to create new gateways into the campus on what will be a corridor that's really assigned to pedestrian movement, bicycle movement, transit movement. As you can see in this um, visualization of the lower portion of the sustainability corridor at Kirby Center Drive, the intent here is to really focus on human movement, pedestrians, bikes, and use of transit in this corridor. Private vehicles will still need to be in this area but in a more limited manner, mainly for ADA parking, access to the child care center, those types of uses. But in general, we're trying to remove uh, the daily traffic from this zone of campus. You also see here expressed the idea of the dining hall at the center and its potential expansion and enhancement. That includes on the lower level, which is currently open to the elements, a new mobility hub. That would be an indoor environment where people can wait for the bus in an enclosed environment with all the amenity you would want. You also see the idea of a winter garden, really addressing that need for off-campus students to have a place to congregate, especially during the winter months, and the expansion of dining to serve the residential population here on campus. So all of that is seen as an integrated project at the very heart of the sustainability corridor. On the upper level of the corridor, currently where Burnside and Vermont are located, the intent is not to rebuild in that area. Instead, the idea is to place a new recreation park, if you will, that will be directly adjacent to the existing residential areas of campus. This is seen as a year-round recreation opportunity, even into the winter with ice skating, other outdoor recreation opportunities, and it's functional in nature. We see this as an opportunity to integrate geothermal that will ultimately contribute to the decarbonization goals here on the campus. So this corridor really provides a heart and a social heart and a functional heart to the campus that is lacking today. The second idea relates to the recreation park, an existing recreation area at the southeast corner of campus. The intent here is to reconfigure the fields that are there currently. They, uh, there are too many softball fields not really addressing the needs for recreation today. Uh, reconfigure those to better align with student life needs. And in doing so, introducing a pedestrian path system between the fields. Currently, there's a perimeter fence that prohibits people moving through this environment, notably in the winter. But by placing uh, the pathway systems between the fields, we can create more of a park-like environment, placing the fencing along the fields themselves rather than at the perimeter. That thereby makes this more accessible to the community and to the campus users as well. Also associated with this is the idea of a new stormwater management pond at the very heart, aligned with the center of the campus. Here, the intent would be to help with some of the water management that noted at the beginning of the presentation and to create a visual amenity at the heart of campus. Underneath this, uh, this important investment will be a geothermal field that will contribute to the decarbonization strategy for the entire campus. So again, this is multifaceted in its approach and intended to contribute to the campus in terms of its energy need, but also in terms of its social and environmental goals. Here is a depiction of what that uh, recreation park could look like. You can see here the notion of uh, pedestrian pathways, jogging pathways, bike networks between the fields. We're looking towards the Solon Campus Center and you see in the foreground of that, the proposed uh, pond that would be part of this environment. So again, intended to be more of a park-like environment that's more accessible throughout the year. The third big idea focuses on greening the edge of campus. Over the long term, the intent is to pull in 
some of the more peripheral housing, housing constructed in the Bagley Nature area back in the 1980s as we look out over time that will reach the end of its useful life. We want to bring that back into the core of campus. Other um, opportunities for redevelopment that will enable us then to focus on the established core, the pedestrian environment. And in doing so, that then op opens the opportunity for reforestation in the Bagley Nature area in particular, on the periphery of campus. That's done with the intent of really creating a more uh, pleasant environment and a more of a, and to, be, to find a better public edge for the campus itself. Associated with that is the recreation park I, I just mentioned a moment ago. And uh, that offers opportunities to really to bring more of that passive recreation, other opportunities to engage the community and the campus in the outdoor environment. We're also looking to shift from surface parking over the long term to uh, structured parking. This will enable us to repurpose some of the areas that are currently dedicated to surface parking and to reforest in those areas as well. So uh, overall, the greening of the campus edge is intended to help us uh, create a better environment overall and to establish new gateways into the campus itself. Here is the proposal for a new gateway on West College, south side of campus, that would lead into an extension of University Drive, where the main vehicular entrance would occur. This is intended to really bring visitors into a more pleasant environment, defined by the recreation park and this new roadway into campus, leading them directly to the Solon, student, uh, Solon Campus Center. Uh, this will be one of several gateways that are proposed around the perimeter of campus. The fourth big idea relates to reinvesting in the campus core. And here the intent is to invest in existing buildings, but in doing so, ensuring that we're delivering on the energy efficiency goals. As we build new buildings, indicated in the darker red color here, uh, the idea is for uh, decarbonization, meeting our decarbonization targets with that construction. With renovation and new construction, the goal is to, and to integrate solar where appropriate so that we're further contributing to the, to the goals of the university. <coughs> there will be demolition as noted, Vermilion and Burt side will be demolished and repurposed as part of the sustainability corridor, the sites that is. We're also divesting of some offsite uh, lab structure and we're uh, thinking of ways in which, again, we can connect <coughs> the campus to its surrounding context and community. And in doing that, thinking of the open space structure and, uh, and contributing to the quality of place. Apologies. Now, at the very heart of the reinvestment in the core is the dining complex, as noted, which uh, currently needs expansion to serve the student body. The goal here is to utilize the under area of what is currently the dining hall to create that mobility hub, that place you wait for the bus, offering amenity to, to commuters and to uh, students who live off campus. That's associated with the winter garden that would be directly adjacent and on the upper level, the expansion of dining to serve the resident population. All of that would be coordinated with the geothermal fields below and connect into the existing residential complex uh, to your left. In the upper right, you see the idea of what that mobility hub might look like. Indoor environment, amenity, a pleasant place to wait for the bus and thereby make that experience better overall. Now, all of this will take time to, to uh, develop and to implement, and we've been thinking through the implementation strategy here. Over the next 15 years or so, we could likely see the new health center, an important need for the university. It's been positioned along that sustainability corridor where there's transit service available and also adjacent to parking. Also, it is within the pedestrian realm and network of the campus, so thereby making it accessible to a number of users. A new residence hall is proposed on the very north end of what I call the Griggs Crescent, the curved uh, buildings you see there in the diagram. That is all part of the sustainability corridor that will redefine the center of campus. Uh, with the dining and mobility hub at its heart. And the reconfigured <coughs> athletic fields with the geo panel will be uh, another an important feature of the plan. The reforestation and parking uh, uh, relocation and reduction, uh, an important part of the strategy moving forward. I should say that's coupled with transportation demand strategies that will be part of this process to help reduce the number of people driving to campus. The new visitor gateway is indicated at G. 
along with other gateways that will be implemented. And then the renovations really become an important part of this strategy moving forward. As we think longer term and the need to replace housing that may be more peripheral, such as in the Bagley Nature area or on the extreme west side of campus, the intent would be to pull that into the core, make it more accessible to the pedestrian realm, make it part of the environment, and to rethink that housing in a much more energy efficient way and link it into the overall decarbonization strategy for the campus, uh, the geothermal fields and uh, the renewable forms of energy that can be used in the future. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm going to give Greg a chance to catch his breath. And while he does, um, provide some context and framing for the climate plan portion of this as we pivot into that section. Uh, um, for that purpose, I'm going to bring us back to the May board meeting when I was here and presenting on the MPAC 2025 goal around building a fully sustainable future. And at that presentation, I was joined by Dr. Heidi Roop who is a professor in soil, water, and climate sciences at the university's Twin Cities campus. Dr. Roop talked about the risks around climate change and gave the board a presentation around the state of climate science. And if you'll recall, she had really five key points. One is that it's us, that the data on climate change is unequivocal, that it's human caused, and that we are contributing to it, which means we can also take action to address it. Second, it's here. Uh, it's not something off in the distant future, but it's something that's materializing already in communities around the world, and certainly communities in Minnesota, including Duluth. And if anyone was at the State Fair uh, last Sunday, you know it was here too, because it was really hot. Um, Sec third, we're committed to change, uh, that there is a certain amount of this that is baked into the climate system. And so there will be climate impacts that are lagging the emissions that are created today. So emissions created today will cause far reaching consequences as we go forward. Fourth, the more we emit, in terms of carbon pollution and climate pollution, the worse it gets. So we have a real choice to make here about how do we address climate change by reducing the carbon pollution that contributes to it. And finally, because of the fact that there is climate change already showing up and there will be climate change impacts going forward, we got to take work and on undertake steps to reduce our risks through adaptation and resilience building. These factors Climate change as a whole threatens our ability to perform and realize our mission as an academic institution. And our stakeholders are looking for us to lead on climate change through delivery of our core mission in terms of the research that we do and the curriculum that we deliver and the outreach and community services that we provide across the state of Minnesota. And we're already doing it, and the Duluth campus is, is definitely a leader in this space. And I'll just highlight two examples that are coming up very soon. Um, Duluth campus colleagues, faculty members, and sustainability staff will be hosting two events in partnership with uh, uh, Dr. Heidi Roop and others in late October around climate resilience and how do we adapt to climate change. And this is a community-wide, a statewide event for people who practice and work in the space of adaptation and resilience building. Then they're also hosting an event for the Duluth community around our climate futures and thinking about how do we cultivate resilience and really position Duluth as a community that will weather the storm, both literal and figurative. Another the way that we lead as an institution is through our example. And that's really what the climate plan that we're presenting to you today gets to is how do we use our campus facilities to demonstrate the solutions that we're talking about, that we're researching and developing through our discovery and innovation, and that we're teaching our students and that they are bringing out into communities that they work with and become part of as they graduate. So the plan that uh, we'll get into in just a second really identifies actions to eliminate the pollution from UMD campus operations that contribute to that climate change. The primary source of pollution, as the Chancellor alluded to earlier, is from the energy that we consume to heat, cool, and power the buildings around campus. And the plan very much focuses on those things and figures out and identifies ways and strategies that we will address that carbon pollution and eliminate it. Another big source of emissions for the Duluth campus in terms of climate pollution is, moving, is how we move our people around, um, whether that be commuting and travel or our own university fleet. 
uh, and the plan directly addresses ways that we move that community to and from. And there's real differences in terms of how the Duluth campus community gets around. We found and discovered through our process that students really use walking and biking as a large means of transportation because they live closer to campus, and that's their primary mode share for how they get to and from, which means they have less emissions, less pollution that they're creating as they travel to and from campus. Whereas our employee base often lives further away and drives personal vehicles to get into the campus. And so the climate plan really works at both ends of those spectrums to figure out how do we create strategies that address and support um, both the change in modalities and, and movement, but also thinking about how do we, for those people who will continue to drive vehicles, provide them paths to lower emissions um, in their personal vehicle transit to and from. The other piece that it really addresses, as Greg alluded to earlier, is that there is you know, adaptation and resilience work that we will be doing throughout this plan, and that's really important because of the climate change that is already baked into the system and that we will continue to experience. And as we talked about in the June meeting, Duluth has been identified as a place that may be a climate refuge because compared to other parts of the country and even other parts of Minnesota, um, it is gonna be relatively shielded from some of the more severe impacts. So the climate plan leans into that and identifies the steps to secure this regional strength, this local strength. Both sets of actions, the steps to eliminate emissions and the steps to make campus more resilient are tightly coordinated and really aligned with the campus plan vision. So they're deeply integrated in that fashion. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg to, deal, to dig into the details of the plan and the specifics. Thanks, Shane. And as noted, this is a very integrated approach, really taking on board the results of our climate action study and integrating it with the physical planning and solutions here. That's informed by key data and information, notably uh, some of the uh, facility conditions assessments that have been performed over time and where we have opportunity to reinvest in buildings and make them more energy efficient. So the red buildings, if you will, here are become the target of renovation and deep energy retrofits as we move forward. We also know with new construction, that's the opportunity to get it right, to, to have a net zero new construction in any new building we build. So therefore the health center, the housing, the dining center and the way we approach that all become key opportunities to demonstrate uh, the ways in which we can do better moving forward. Those in combination are key aspects of the plan. Now we know with energy supply and fortunately here in Minnesota, your grid will be carbon neutral by 2040, that's the prediction. With that it comes the opportunity to electrify, to really rely on that grid to deliver the energy you need in a carbon neutral manner. And that, that becomes important not only for buildings, but for transportation. But through uh, our assessment of campus and the efficiencies that we can gain with the district systems in place, we know that we need to move to low temperature hot water rather than steam. We will rely on geothermal moving forward to deliver that low temperature hot water. We'll need to be able to heat and cool water or have other thermal storage available to help with, with that process, energy storage. And uh, again, we'll be looking to that decarbonized grid over time to really contribute to our strategy here. We'll also employ some uh, on-campus renewable energy. Right now, about 1% of the power is uh, coming from uh, some of the solar panels on campus today. We'll continue to add to that as indicated here by purple. Any new building or any renovation where possible, solar will be integrated so that we increase that on-site uh, renewable energy production. Now working with closely with our engineers, AEI, they've put a lot of thought into how we could phase an approach to move toward this renewable future. Uh, you see here what are called nodes, more or less phases of, con of implementation that could occur. Uh, beginning with node one, which might occur around the new residence hall that's proposed and the opportunities for geothermal in that area. Node two really focuses on that sustainability corridor and the opportunity presented by the site vacated by Burnside and Vermilion to create a geothermal field that then could be part of uh, the contribution that you would make toward the existing residential areas at the very heart of campus. Uh, node three would focus on uh, moving towards low temperature hot water and remaining in buildings, existing buildings at the north part of campus. Similarly, node four would do the same on the south side 
and then node five is really the point in time when you integrate with the geothermal system to make that uh, a, a highly efficient system over time. So each of these steps contribute to decarbonization over time and uh, as, uh, as funding is available and as uh, renovations can occur over the years ahead. There are other aspects that are associated with the Climate Action Plan as well, other emission topics. Uh, as, as Shane noted, there's a great, your students are walking to campus in great numbers and utilizing bus services as well. But that's something we want to ensure continues in future, thereby making that a better experience through these outward connections and the mobility hub, other things that make that a better experience. We also know that there's going to be an increase in electrical vehicles over time, just given the way the market's going. And with your own fleet, there's the opportunity to electrify the fleet, so further reducing your own emissions associated with uh, the vehicles that you purchase. Eliminating fugitive emissions associated with refrigerants, other, other factors on campus will continue to be part of this. And then eventually, uh, you know, carbon offsets and some sequestration will be part of the thinking. Sequestration in the form of uh, some of the reforestation that we're proposing uh, can, it can certainly contribute to that idea. Now, adaptation, the climate adaptation uh, aspects of this plan, and uh, really focus on that future of where we're headed with the climate and how we need to be responsive to that. We know that we need to, in, in adapting here, we need to maintain redundancy in our systems. That's been factored into the engineering here. Uh, as noted, uh, increasing uh, native plantings through reforestation, other habitat and shade uh, opportunities that come with that are in, embedded here. Uh, we're looking for ways to uh, enhance our, our surface water and uh, make sure that we're managing water, especially if we're gonna, going to have increased rainfall. There's stormwater management and practices for managing water across the campus and the landscape are proposed. Uh, recreation and ways of which we can offer uh, additional landscape opportunities there. And then just creating those welcoming spaces across campus uh, become important to social resilience. Chancellor. Thank you, Greg. Um, connect a couple dots and then hopefully uh, engage in some dialogue with all of you. But. Uh, we use the term aspirational, I think I did, I think Monique did, and you know that term in and of itself can lead one to believe, well, this is someone else's problem down the road. And that's not the way we're thinking about it, but there are a couple elements that are right before us today, and when this presentation was, we were planning this, I didn't realize that we would have the opportunity to, to connect these dots for you. So the three projects that you heard about today in, uh, in uh, the, the HEPR presentation for ours, if you look at that map that's up, um, they are the light pink colored ones, the, the, the Heller Hall Humanities and, and Library Annex. Every one of those is central to campus and provides an opportunity to take a no regrets step to advancing better environmental outcomes over time, better efficiency setting the stage for future you know, low water or low, low temperature, hot water heating, those kinds of things. So there's ways to take action today that help us get to that, that more sustainable and aspirational the future. So every one of those three fits in wonderfully in terms of what we're talking about here. So I wanted to pull that one up. Um, I also wanted to make sure that, uh, that, that you're thinking about the fact that of the buildings in red that you see on this one, most of which have to do with student housing or dining, those are dependent, of course, on us sorting out our long-term financial sustainability, future, and our enrollment. So obviously none of us, President Ettinger, myself, or anybody in the room would bring before you a plan to build something new when we don't have, we haven't sorted out what does the long-term enrollment plan look like. So we're working on that and uh, those are critical and uh, hopefully we do find that path forward and tearing down Burnside and Vermilion and building something new to well, that would just maintain the amount of space we have. But uh, again, those are <coughs> further out while we sort out what does this competitive marketplace look like and how does UMD win in that. But I wanna be sure I'd, before I break here and open it up for questions, 
with the, the chair's permission, the health center is not that. We, we need to find a path forward for a health center on this campus that is unrelated to how many, you know, whether our, whether our target enrollment is 10,000, 10,500, or where it sits today at 9,500. We cannot go forward if, if my successor is in front of you in seven years talking about an aspirational health center, we will have failed our students in Duluth. So we, we, that's one of the challenges we've done. I'm not here to, to sort this out today, but the challenge is we don't have a good funding model for things that are driven by student fees like housing, dining, and health centers. So anyway, I just I hold that one up for you. That, that, that's first on this list for a reason, and we'll be working with the team here um, you know, and on campus to figure out what is the funding model for that without blowing up student fees. But that one uh, it, and those HEPR projects, I think, are, are near-term things that uh, many of you will see us in a very optimistic uh, statement by me, you will see us back here talking about ways that we've sorted that out in the best interest of students, um, faculty, staff, and in the long haul, our environment. So we look forward to, uh, to being back in October um, with uh, hopefully your, uh, your readiness to approve. Chair Hipsch, uh, we're done, and uh, we're ready for, uh, for questions. Okay, thank you very much. Great presentation, really. Really great. I'm just gonna, when we get this, I wish it did take 15 years or 30 years. I was thinking <laughs> two years or four years, but that's, I just don't buy green bananas, so. Write a check. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wasn't born with a lot of patience, so. Uh, Tad Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Chancellor and uh, the panel for the presentation. Uh, um, those of us familiar with this, at least three of us here on the panel with UMD campus. Uh, are, are, I, these are wonderful ideas and wonderful uh, potential changes. And I've personally sold my house to a climate refugee, so I know they're, they're coming. Um, I, it's going to take a while, but uh, they're, um, there's a new crowd coming in, and, and that's got to be good for UMD, everything from your MBA program to uh, other courses that are offered. Um, I really like the decarbonization plan. Mm -hmm. Looks like geothermals in there and, and uh, Reddit and solar panels and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and I was fascinated by the sustainability corridor, which runs between uh, Hartley, which is up north, and then Bagley, and then uh, through the campus into Chester Park. And it looks like just based on the uh, the drawing in front of me, um, what used to be St. Marie Street is now Skyway Parkway, um, Skyline Parkway. And then, uh, so uh, when it comes to planning this out, and I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but I'm just curious if uh, there's going to be the idea is to kind of change the road system in Duluth a little bit so that um, if you want to have this gigantic green space, um, and there's uh, College Street there, which is kind of blocking you off from Chester Park. So uh, I don't know if you've thought that far ahead, but I just wanted to get the, the lay of the land, I guess. No, no, th thank you. Good observations. Uh, you know, the intent is to, uh, from that heart and along the sustainability corridor, extend the bike pass and pedestrian pass across these roads and link notably into Bagley Nature Area. There are trails within Bagley now that then connect onto Huntley Park. So connecting into that network and thereby making that more accessible to the student body and then also for the community to feel that they can come into campus. You're right in noting that the connection to Chester Park will make, will need to follow some city streets. But in, with, in working with the city, the idea would be to, to make sure that those routes continue along uh, maybe adjacent to streets or as part of the bike lanes on the on those streets to connect with the park Chester Park to the south. But I think the intent are when we looked at where UMD is positioned relative to these parks, we're like, that's the heart mm -hmm. that's missing. Mm -hmm. And so therefore that's the opportunity to really connect to the community and to bring the community in. And just to, I think a lot of young people go to UMD because of the access to outdoor trails and skiing and outdoor activities in general. And I think this would add to the, um, you know, 
attractiveness of the campus. And then there's the other group that stays indoors all winter and wears their gym shorts uh, <laughs> but uh, throughout the winter. But uh, thank you for your presentation. It looks really interesting. That's why we have the winter garden. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's exciting. Thank you. Uh, student Representative Groshan. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is going to be pretty similar to what Tad said, but um, I want to put in a student perspective here and say just how great you guys have done a job with um, student input. Thank you. I personally was a part of it from the student survey to the open forum to the sub uh, facility subcommittee who voted on where to put the new health center. So I just want to say how great of a job you've done and how positive student uh, reactions have been. When, even when I brought it to my organization or talked to other student organizations, everybody has had positive reactions about okay. this. And I'm glad you guys are by, like Tad said, um, I'm glad you guys have bought into the, as Chancellor McMillan said, the place-based uh, mentality, since there are a lot of fishermen, boaters, hunters, hikers, bikers, all that you can imagine here at UMD, and that's why they stay. So um, good job. That's Thank all you. I have to say. Thanks, Cole. So we have Regent Kenyanya, but he's not in here. Does everyone want to <laughs> pitch in for him? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't know what to do. Nobody ever told me what to do in this situation. <laughs> I wasn't trained in for this. Uh, I guess we're going <laughs> to... Oh, Regent Turner will. Oh, okay, Good Regent question. Turner will take it. There he is. <laughs> Did you ring? <laughs> cool vice chair. Yeah. You're up. I'm up my head. <laughs> my apologies. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I caught the tail end of the student representative complimenting the committee he was on, um, which is, <laughs> but no, great work. Um, this is a really, really comprehensive. First thing that stands out to me right away um, is sustainability is not a sub bullet point of the plan. I mean, it's, it's part of the plan. I think that has to be the standard um, going forward for, for anything we did. I mean, a lot of people are working hard and considering these things. I'm not saying that's not happening, but um, you know, we have to have that mindset as well. Probably fresh on my mind, because as Regent Turner pointed out, we were out with the Institute on Environment yesterday. Um, Director Stennis was there as well, and um, Sabina, who, who directs international partnerships for the Institute, I asked her, I said, you know, Sabina, you keep inviting me to these, they're great, but as you know, the governing board, wh what are we supposed to be thinking about? Um, how do we approach this? And she said, uh, she said you, you just have to get comfortable. Anytime something comes forward, you ask yourself, how does this impact carbon footprint? And at some point, you're gonna have to say, it's going to be a really good project, makes total sense, but it's not moving us in the right direction. We say we're not doing that um, and get comfortable. So th this is going to be my first time asking, but I can't. I mean, it was fully baked in here. Um, so just wanted to make that comment first and really appreciate that um, as well. So as I look at the, uh, the, the plan, th in terms of the, the academic buildings, academic facilities, there's nothing's changing there in terms of vision or alignment. I mean, it's the old buildings that would have been on the HEPA request anyway. Most of the changes here are around campus experience, transportation, student life. And uh, Chancellor, you touched on this briefly. I'd like to highlight it a little more. Um, we have a residence hall in here. That's under student life. Um, we have dining in here. That's under student life. Health services, that's under student life. Athletics, I don't think we're talking about intercollegiate, we're talking about rec sports, that's under student life. Parking and transportation, a unit of student life at the UMD campus. Those are all fee supported. I mean, you touched on that briefly, those are fee supported units. And I think our practice as a university has been to, um, to not put, uh, frankly, O&M dollars here. Um, so as we think about all these, and this is, you know, when I look at this list, this is not a some aspirational, boy, it'd be really nice. These are these are the things we need. This is a prudent. I'm sure if I'm sure if we told you guys to dream bigger, there there would have been more. This is this is what's actually needed. Um, so these things have to happen, as you talked about, especially with the health services building. But 
as we look at where enrollment's been, where it's at now, there's that there's that dotted line of, of aspirational, but you know we really don't know um, what's the impact on student service fees if 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 we choose to only fund all this by student service fees. That that will be quite the increase, and and depending on how enrollment plays out, it'll be even more or less depending on you know how many people you're dividing that by. Um, so you you kind of mentioned that Chancellor McMillan as something that y'all will consider. I think what you didn't say is that something we have to consider in terms of how we're willing um, to think about those projects and, and you know where we're willing to direct support from. Um, I don't know if you have any reactions to that. Otherwise, it's just a comment. <clears throat> Regent or Chair Hipsch, Regent Kenyanya, you've uh, you've in a very articulate way gotten to the core of the issue I was just hinting at, and this isn't the place or time to solve for that, but uh, we, the, I think there's something approaching $200 million of uh, student fee supported investment here in that chart that's still up. And you know, that would, that would 5X, I don't know what the number right. is, it'd be um, unsustainable from a student fee basis. I only highlighted the health center because we have to solve for that, and that's my job in concert with my system partners here to figure out how, what else could we do there, and rather than waiting until we have enough students to fund that. But I think you bring to bear, you bring to light the fact that uh, the energy system is, is equally probably more expensive to get to uh, geothermal, and if we're gonna do things differently and chase big goals, we're probably gonna have to start thinking differently about our long-term funding models. Heaper here, O and M here, student dollars here. I think that's where you're going, and that's the kind of thinking that I'll be generating around the smaller health center project. But if we're ever going to yep. get to geothermal, we have to think about things very differently. Yep. Just a closing comment, Mr. Chair. Sure, go ahead. Appreciate that, Chancellor. Um, yes, that that's exactly what I was uh, trying to get at, and I, I guess my comment to the board: great plan. I definitely support it, but if if we're not then prepared to be a little more open-minded about how we fund these, then we're essentially endorsing, um, again, 5X, that's, that's just a fake number we're throwing out there. We're, we're endorsing that kind of impact to the student service fee unless we're prepared to um, look elsewhere. Thanks for all the work. Thanks for the plan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And, and you know, to the Chief Sustainability Officer, Shane, uh, was it here in May, and the cost of doing nothing is very high, too. Mm -hmm. And we have to balance that with the cost of doing stuff. So uh, anyways, uh, Regent Turner. Yeah, quick question. So is the um, Duluth City Council like totally on board with all of this? Just wanting to know, hopefully they're all supporting you, and I'll certainly use any poll that I have up there with all of them. <laughs> I've been in front of that council a few times. And then, like, when I visited Morris, which was, was really cool, I was wondering if um, Duluth taxpayer dollars help with this. Um, I saw all of their sporting facilities at the Morris campus, and, it's, and, it, it, and it was a kind of collaboration with the community and the colleges and the businesses, et cetera, that created this. And then um, the whole community can use these um, facilities. So is that something that's... So I'm sorry if that's more than one question, but I think it's two. Uh, Chair Hipsch, Regent Turner, uh, to the question of how involved the city has been and how supportive they are, we haven't had long conversations with uh, representatives, electeds, but we have had deep conversations with staff. And an example of great collaboration is planning for that bike path that Regent Johnson was asking about along college to connect ultimately across and get to Chester Park. So one of the last meetings we had with city staff were, where are you in that planning civil public works project and how can we make sure those bike paths align? So there has been general support from the city, but in my opinion, great news from the people who are gonna be spending public money to make connections. So that's great news from city of Duluth. Um, I'm gonna to defer to Chancellor because he knows Duluth conditions more, but traditionally there hasn't been the same models like at, at Morris or even at Rochester between the city and the campus. But that's just my historical perspective and I trust Chancellor to give us more detail. Uh, thanks Monique and Chair Hipsch and uh, Regent Turner. 
we, we, our facilities are wildly in demand for off-campus users. We, we, as Greg pointed out, we don't have enough recreational fitness facilities to meet the demand of even a smaller student body. They're, they're, they're heavily used. Ice time, swimming pool, we, we do what we can to support community needs there, but we haven't had the kind of uh, build it and co-finance it, bring the city in on our campus. We've got a reverse example of that with Amsoil Arena, where we are the primary tenant and our and and be West being the Bulldogs being men's and women's hockey being the primary tenant enabled the community to build that big ice arena. Without us that never gets done. But thinking about it the way a Morris type example, we they, we 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 do our very best to bring the community in, make them partners, give them access to things like pools tennis courts and all that stuff, but we try to prioritize it for our students too and we're constantly out of, so when Greg mentioned earlier the fitness resources there don't, they're not enough to support rec sports and outdoor programming for the <coughs> students we have, we would really need to think bigger picture if we're going to do something that could enhance opportunities for the community around us. But those partnerships should be on the table. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all for your presentation today, it was really, inter really interesting, thank you. Now we're moving on to our consent agenda. Senior Vice President, uh, Senior Vice President Franz, will you summarize the items of today's consent report? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members of the committee. Com um, committee. So the September's consent agenda includes six purchases of goods and services, three real estate transactions, a request for approval to use you more legacy funds, one employment agreement two capital budget amendments, and two schematic designs. I'd like to just highlight a few of those um, as we go through this. First is a contract for Invigo RMS, the Jackson Laboratory and Charles River for laboratory animals through our Research Animal Resources Department on the Twin Cities campus. This unit serves over 400 teams and they work and the work they do to support the university's $1 billion research portfolio. The current contract expires this year. <clears throat> the request before you today is a result of a request for a proposal for a five-year term. We've had similar contracts in 2013 and in 2018. The second purchase I would like to highlight is a contract for services with Videotronics for safety and security system services for our Public Safety Emergency Communication Center. You may recall this contract because just in May, we asked for permission to uh, spend a, a million dollars over the next five years in May. However, with the additional one-time funding from the state, we are now asking that contract to be increased by $6 million, bringing the total value to $7 million. This is a really important and uh, far-reaching contract. This contract is necessary to accelerate efforts to upgrade, enhance, and replace end-of-life equipment related to video surveillance, card access to buildings, alarms that make up the university security systems. The contract will provide dedicated services and resources to the Crooks and Duluth, Morris, and Rochester campuses and bolster existing resources of the Twin Cities campus. This work is imperative to our ability to better secure facilities, increase visibility for public safety responders during incidents, and improve our abilities to solve and prevent crime around the university and the surrounding areas, including all of our campuses. We want to thank the state of Minnesota for their support for this important work. I have three real estate transactions I'd like to mention to you today. The University of Minnesota Southern Research and Outreach Center is seeking a land exchange with ConAgra Foods Packaged Foods, LLC. <coughs> the university was approached by ConAgra proposing to transfer approximately 26 acres to the university in exchange for the 12 acres of university property. This difference in acreage is due to the fact that the land that the university will receive has been fallow for, fallow for several years. The additional acres that the university will receive as part of the exchange will advance the university's research mission and the university property to be exchanged and will positively, positively impact the community and advance our relationship with our industry neighbor. The second real estate transaction is for the acquisition of a 160-acre parcel in Mauer County as we continue our efforts to assemble a total of 1,600 acres to support the farm program. This transaction brings us to a total of approximately 1,216 acres either acquired or under contract for the farm project. Finally, the university's 
Minnesota's Learning Abroad Center is seeking authorization to execute a nine-year lease agreement for an office and training space in Montpellier, France, to support their learning abroad programs there, which have been ongoing for over 40 years. The Learning Abroad Center there is seeking a lease at this new location due to the increased costs and use restrictions at its current location. The leased area comprises about 2,700 square feet, and the lease will run through 2032. The minimum lease time in France is nine years, with periods to um, reduce that at different points. Next, we seek authorization to use funds from the UMOR Legacy Fund to finance costs associated with the future of advanced agriculture research in Minnesota, or the Farm Project. The fund now holds about $13.2 million from commercial activities at Umore Park that we just we discussed a few minutes ago. These were generated primarily from mining lease royalty payments and the sale of 435 acres for residential development in 2021. Our first step was to seek guidance from the Office of the General Counsel on the 2009 and 2015 board resolutions regarding the use of Umore legacy funds. Copies of those previous resolutions are included in your docket for reference. The Office of General Counsel determined that the October 2009 resolution establishing the fund delegated authority for use of those funds to the university president and that the February 2015 resolution did not affect those authorities. However, since interim president Edinger has recused himself from any matters related to farm as part of his conflict management plan, the Office of General Counsel indicated that authority to use a fund reversed to the Board of Regents, which is why we bring this item to you for approval today. We seek approval to use the funds from the UMOR Legacy Fund to advance, to finance costs associated with the design and development of the farm project. These costs include land acquisition, pre-design, schematic designs, <clears throat> site preparation, infrastructure, construction, and acquisition of equipment. We also recommend that if debt financing is used, that money from the fund may be used to support that debt service. To be clear, for any future Board of Regent actions involving farm, such as a capital budget amendment, we will indicate when you more legacy funds are included as a funding source for information to the Board. The next item we have is an employment agreement before you today is for Dr. Melinda Pettigrew, who upon your, your action today will be appointed our next Dean of the School of Public Health effective December 29, 2023. We have two capital budget amendments for projects that were not ready for inclusion in our annual capital budget, meet, budget this last spring. We have the renovation of the main production kitchen that supports our dining center operations in Duluth and the renovation of our dining facilities in Mill Middlebrook Hall on the West Bank campus of the Twin Cities. We have three schematic designs for projects on the Twin Cities campus that have now been com completed the design phase and are ready to move into to constructions. They include the Cedar Creek classroom expansion at the Cedar Creek Reserve, renovation of the Shepherd Laboratory on the East Bank, and the new women's gymnastics building that will be adjacent to the south side of the existing indoor football performance facility. That's my summary of the consent report. I'm sorry it's so long. Thank you. That's okay. Uh, before I invite a motion to recommend approval of the consent report, you're welcome to ask questions, make comments, or ask an item to be separated out from the report to be voted on separately. Are there any questions, comments, or requests to separate an item out? So hearing none, is there a motion to recommend approval of the consent report? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All opposed, say nay. Nay. Or no, or whatever you want to say. <laughs> <laughs> the motion is not approved. Uh, the motion is approved. Sorry. <laughs> Get used to these annotations on this thing. Stop sometimes the steal. it's no, sometimes it's nay, sometimes it's anyway. Okay, we are. Uh... <laughs>
the information items. Yeah, just the information items now. So. Mr. Chair, I have a few more comments to okay, make. Okay, let's take them away. <laughs> for, the, for the first item, the Central Reserves and General Contingency Allocations, we do not have any transactions to report this month. Second, we provide you with the Annual Capital Financing and Debt Management Report. This is a second report since the university's sale of $500 million in interest-only bonds in April of 2022. And finally, we have our annual strategic facilities and a real estate report this month as an added resource to our capital planning efforts discussed earlier today. This report is a comprehensive summary of the university's physical assets. It includes updates on the university's facilities condition assessment and space utilization, real estate transaction from the past fiscal year, and approved capital projects over $1 million. It also provides an excellent recap of the work our teams have done this past year to support the mission through real estate, space management, and capital improvement. And that concludes my re remarks on information items. Thank you. Thank you, Senior Vice President. Uh, there being no additional business before the committee, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.